<laughs> the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion in Modern English A one-page summary Goyim are mentally inferior to Jews and can't run their nations properly. For their sake and ours, we need to abolish their governments and replace them with a single government. This will take a long time and involve much bloodshed, but it's for a good cause. Here's what we'll need to do. Police our agents and helpers everywhere. Take control of the media and use it in propaganda for our plans. Start fights between different races, classes, and religions. Use bribery, threats, and blackmail to get our way. Use free Masonic lodges to attract potential public officials. Appeal to successful people's egos. Appoint puppet leaders who can be controlled by blackmail. Replace royal rule with socialist rule, then communism, then despotism. Abolish all rights and freedoms, except the right by force, by us. Sacrifice people, including Jews sometimes, when necessary. Eliminate religion. Replace it with science and materialism. Control the education system to spread deception and destroy intellect. Rewrite history to our benefit. Create entertaining distractions. Corrupt minds with filth and perversion. Encourage people to spy on one another. Keep the masses in poverty and perpetual labor. Take possession of all true wealth, property, and especially gold. Use gold to manipulate the markets, causing depressions, etc. Introduce a progressive tax on wealth. Replace sound investment with speculation. Hmm. Make long-term interest-bearing loans to governments. Hmm. Give bad advice to governments and everyone else. Eventually, the Goyim will be so angry with their governments, because we'll blame them for the resulting mess, that they'll gladly have us take over. We will then appoint a descendant of David to be the king of the world, and the remaining Goyim will bow down and sing his praises. Everyone will live in peace and obedient order, under his glorious rule. The Chapters of the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion in Modern English Protocol 1. What We Believe Protocol 2. Economic Wars Protocol 3. Methods of Conquest Protocol 4. Materialism to Replace Religion Protocol 5. Despotism and Modern Progress Protocol 6. Takeover Techniques Protocol 7. Worldwide Wars Protocol 8. Provisional Governments Protocol 9. Re-Education Protocol 10. Preparing for Power Protocol 11. The Totalitarian State Protocol 12. Control of the Media Protocol 13, Distractions. Protocol 14, Assault on Religion. Protocol 15, Ruthless Suppression. Protocol 16, Brainwashing. Protocol 17, Abuse of Authority. Protocol 18, Arrest of Opponents. Protocol 19, Rulers and the People. Protocol 20, Financial Program Protocol 21 Loans and Credit Protocol 22 The Power of Gold Protocol 23 Instilling Obedience And finally Protocol 24 The Qualities of the Ruler Protocol number 1 What We Believe Let's discuss the difference between us Jews and them Goyim, cattle, or non-Jews. People are basically evil by nature. The bad people in this world far outnumber the good. So the best form of government is not one that holds reasoned discussions with its people, but one that uses tyranny. Most people would gladly become an all-powerful dictator and sacrifice the well-being of others for their own benefit. 
Where do people get their guidance? And what stops them from acting out their evil desires? In olden times, people behaved like animals and were guided by the force of their bestial instincts. Then, as society developed, humans developed laws to follow, but these laws were based on those same natural instincts. So the only valid law is the, quote, law of nature, end quote, also known as the use of force. Freedom is not only, is only an ideal. Nobody really has it. But if you want to win an election, it's good to preach the ideals of freedom, even if you plan to deprive your voters of it. If your opponent believes in the concept of freedom, like as a libertarian, Ron Paul, use that against him. Because if he foolishly believes in freedom, he won't be willing to use the underhanded tactics that you do. He will play fair while you play dirty. Any government that is based on freedom loses control over its people. This is a terrible thing, because remember, that people are basically bad, and the only way to guide them is by use of force. If a government is guided by freedom, the people will become weak. We can take advantage of that weakness to overpower them and install a new government. Gold. There was a time when religion was the guiding force of mankind, but now... Money is more important than religion. Money, especially gold, is the new guiding force because it gives power and freedom to the common people. But that freedom is bad because they'll always want more and don't know how to use it. We cannot allow that. Self-governance can be given to the masses, but only long enough for them to form a disorganized mob. At that point, we should intervene to create strife and racial hatred between their different classes and races, one percenter against the 99 percenters. This will cause them to fight and kill each other, hopefully starting a civil war. Hmm. Once a nation is engaged in civil war, it will either destroy itself or be weakened to the point where it can be taken over by another foreign power. In either case, our job will be done, as they will no longer be a threat to us. If that nation ends up in bankruptcy, we'll offer to loan them some of our money. Hm. They'll have no option but to take it. If anyone claims that the above is immoral, let me ask them this. Suppose a nation has two enemies, an external enemy, which is a neighboring nation, and an internal enemy represented by political pri rivals who might try to overthrow the nation from within. Well... If it is acceptable to destroy the other nation without any regard to morals, then why should it not also be acceptable to destroy the internal enemy? After all, it's the more dangerous of the two and the more likely to succeed in destroying the society. Who in their right mind could expect to govern the people by the use of reason debate? Because those people who are really quite stupid when compared to you, the Jews could then counter your arguments with their own silly arguments, and then you'd have to keep debating them. You'd get nowhere. The people who make up society, the voters, are lame-brained numbskulls who never achieve anything. Useless eaters? Hmm. They spend their time following astrology charts and football. They obviously cannot think logically. In fact, the only time that they agree on anything is when we trick the majority of them into believing something. So, they may as well just let us do our job of ruling them. Otherwise, the whole nation will erupt into anarchy. Politics has nothing to do with morals. Anyone who tries to govern according to morals is a moron and unsuitable for office. A true politician must resort to cunning and lies if he expects to get anywhere. Great qualities such as honesty and integrity are a burden for any ruler. Anyone in politics who decides to start behaving like this, their career will be over long before they know it. Most Goyim believe that their ruler should have these qualities, but of course, we Jews know better. Might is right. There is a commonly held belief that all people are born with rights, meaning that they should be allowed to do or have certain things in life, regardless of who they are. But there is no way of proving this. What is it invisibly? Then, when it has gained enough strength, we can unleash it, and it will be unstoppable, 
because no one will be prepared for it. We need to do a lot of evil things in order to gain power, but that's okay. Because once we have power over everything, then we can use it for good things, like running the nations properly and efficiently. We could never do that if we gave people the freedoms that they believe that they should have. The end justifies the means. So let's put aside moral issues and focus on the end result. We have a good long-range plan here, and we cannot afford to deviate from it. Otherwise, all of our work over the centuries will have been for nothing. In order to plan our actions effectively, we must take into account that the common people are an incoherent mob of blubbering idiots who can't even look after themselves. These people are blind, senseless, and have no ability to reason. In fact, they'll get suckered in by anyone. While the majority of them are total nincompoops that would follow one another over a clifftop, as they have no leadership skills, occasionally one might emerge who appears to have some degree of intelligence. However, even these people do not understand how to lead, and if you let them, they would bring an entire nation to ruin. Only someone trained from childhood to serve as a leader can truly understand politics. People left to look after themselves will be brought to ruin. That's because their leaders who emerge from amongst them are only interested in power and glory. Is it possible for these people to put aside their self-interest and manage the affairs of nations? <laughs> like, can they defend themselves from an external enemy? No way, we say. When a project of that scale is divided up among the most dim-witted members of that society, it becomes unintelligible to them. We are despots. Only a despotic ruler can effectively carry out large operations and distribute all the necessary resources to the various departments so that important plans can be executed. From this we conclude that the most effective government is one that concentrates all of its power into the hands of a single responsible person. Without absolute despotism, there is no way to guide the masses and civilization will collapse. They are savage barbarians and behave like that at every opportunity given to them. The moment the people gain freedom, it quickly turns into anarchy, which is just simple savagery. Notice that when people are given freedoms, they use it to drink themselves senseless and behave like animals. We ourselves should avoid behaving like that. Goyim are always drinking alcohol or thinking about doing so. We caused this to happen by using our many agents to promote it as part of their culture. It increased immorality and makes their youth stupid and pliable. We have agents placed everywhere, occupying many positions throughout society, such as tutors, lackeys, governesses in the houses of the wealthy, by clerks and others. We also have a lot of women agents acting as prostitutes who assist in the corruption process. Our modus operandi is simple. Force and make believe. Only force gives you power especially in the hands of a smooth talker. Violence and deception must be the rule of any politician who wants to remain in power. This may be considered evil, but please remember, evil is justified when it is used to achieve good. Therefore, we must not stop at bribery, deceit, and treachery if they can help us attain our end goal. In politics, we must know how to seize the property of others without hesitation, if it allows us to gain full power over them. We may need to wage many wars in order to achieve our ultimate peace. Between wars, we can replace the horrors of wars by less noticeable and more satisfactory sentences of death. This is necessary to maintain terror in the populace, which leads then to blind submission. A just but merciless penal system is the greatest strength of the state. We do this not only for the sake of gain, but also in the name of duty. For the sake of our victory, we must stick to the program of violence and make believe. It is enough for them to know that we are merciless for any disobedience to cease.
The principle of balancing accounts, particularly the repayment of debt, is strongly ingrained and one which we will take advantage of. We will use this principle as a means to bring all governments under the control of our super government. We shall end liberty. Far back in ancient times, we were the first to stand among crowds of people and cry out the words liberty, equality, fraternity. The people fell for our bait. They picked up those words and started repeating them parrot-like throughout the world. As a result, they have taken away the well-being of the world and the true freedom of the individual, which is formerly well protected from mob pressure. The so-called wise men of the Goyim, the intellectuals, could not make anything out of these words. They just cannot see that in nature there is no equality or freedom. That nature herself has established inequality of minds, characters, and capacities. They never stopped for once to consider that the mob is a blind thing, and as such can only elect leaders that they themselves must be blind as the mob itself. And even if the mob does manage to find someone intelligent, that person wouldn't understand politics, as we pointed out earlier. Goyim do not take any of this into consideration. Thanks to dumbass libertarians, the words liberty, equality, and fraternity have spread to all corners of the earth. These words installed peace, quiet, and solidarity throughout all Goyim of the earth, and thus weakened their strength. As you will see later, this helped us to our victory. It gave us the possibility of getting our hands on the master stroke, the destruction of privileges and power of their royalty. That royal class was the only defense the Goyim had against us. On the ruins of the eternal and air-based aristocracy of the Goyim, we have set up the aristocracy of our educated class, headed by the aristocracy, aristocracy of money. The entry qualifications to this aristocracy are based on wealth, which is dependent upon us, the money changers, and on knowledge, which also comes from us, especially from our learned elders who have provided such inspiration. Our victory has been made easier by fact that whenever we sought favors from men in power, we always appealed to their most basic of desires, like cash money and all kinds of material goodies. Even one human weakness is often enough to pass control of these men over to those offering the bribes. The concept of freedom has enabled us to convince the people of all countries that their government is a servant of the people, that the people are the true owners of the country, and that the servant can be replaced like a worn-out glove. This possibility of replacing the representatives of the people gives us the power to appoint a new government. Protocol 2. Economic Wars Whenever we start a war, we should not do so for the purpose of gaining territory, at least not as a general rule. Instead, we should do it for economic gains. This way, Everyone will see how powerful we are, and they will be in fear of our many international spies and agents who roam the earth without limitation. National rights will then be wiped out by our international rights, which are the proper sense of right, the right of force. We will then rule the nations in the same way that the nations rule their citizens. The people chosen by us to act as rulers of a nation will not be those trained in the art of leadership. Instead, we'll select them based on their capacity to take orders. They'll be puppets under the control of smart men who will be their advisors, specialists bred and reared from early childhood to rule the affairs of the whole world. As you well know, these specialists of ours have been trained to get the information they need from our political plans, from the lessons of history, and from observations made of current events. The Goyim are not guided by observations of history, but by theory, theories on how the world is supposed to work. They do not bother to check whether these theories are true or not. 
so do not trouble yourself with them. Let them amuse themselves until the final hour strikes, and their utopian beliefs and entertainments are on the memories of all that they have enjoyed. Let them organize their beliefs around scientific theories. We are constantly using our media to encourage Gleam to have blind confidence in these theories. The intellectuals of the Goyim will fill their minds with this scientific knowledge without questioning its validity or usefulness. Our agent specialists have carefully determined what type of knowledge the intellectuals receive, and in this way we can steer their minds in the directions that we want. Destructive Education do not suppose for one moment that these statements are empty words. Think carefully of the successes that we have arranged for Darwinism, Marxism, Nietzscheism. To us Jews, it should be obvious to see how destructive these ideologies have been upon the minds of the Goyim. It is vital that we take into account the thoughts, characters, and cultural tendencies of the nations in order that we avoid making mistakes in the takeover of their political and administrative affairs. In order for us to succeed, we must adjust our methods to accommodate for the cultural and, relig and regional differences of nations. Similarly, if a culture should change over time, we must change our methods to suit. The media has a great influence on people's thoughts. It was previously in the hands of sovereign, sovereign governments, but it is now under our control. Our media's role is to convince people that our plans are important and to allow them to express some dissatisfaction which will help create discontent. The media can be a powerful force for freedom of speech, but Goyim do not know how to use this force so it always will fall into our hands. Through the media, we have gained the power of influence while remaining invisible. Thanks to the media, we now have the gold in our hands. Mind you, we also needed this to use an awful lot of violence and underhanded tactics to achieve this. But it was worth it. Even though we had to sacrifice many of our own people. Because, after all, in the eyes of our God, one Jew is worth 1,000 Goyim. Protocol 3. Methods of Conquest. I have some good news. We're only a few steps away from achieving our goal. There's a small way to go, but when we get there, we'll have achieved the closing of our symbolic snake. This snake represents the spreading of our people across Europe. When the snake closes into a loop, the whole of Europe will be locked into its constricting coils. European Union. The, the constitutions of the various nations will soon break down. We have designed them with a certain lack of accurate balance, such that their component versus grind against each other to the point where the whole constitution falls apart. Goyim are under the impression that those verses are welded strongly together, and any discrepancies between them should balance out over time. But their monarchs, who might enforce that welding, are surrounded by representatives who play the role of fools, lusting for uncontroll and irresistible power. The monarchs owe their power to the terror that has breathed into their palaces. As they no longer have direct access to their people, the kings on their thrones are not able to come to terms with them and cannot strengthen themselves against those who seek to take their power. We have created a rift between the far-sighted sovereign power and the blind force of the people, such that both have lost their effectiveness. For like the blind man and his stick, they are powerless when they are separated. In order to incite those who seek power to misuse that power, we have caused all political forces to turn against one another. This breaks up their libertarian desires towards seeking independence. To this end, we have stirred up every political, 
social and minority group. We have armed all sides. We have labeled authority as a target for every ambition. We have turned parliaments into gladiatorial arenas where many confused issues brawl. With a bit more of this, disorders and bankruptcy will be universal across this planet. Parliaments and administrative boards have been turned into oratorical con contests of inexhaustible blabbers. Unscrupulous journalists descend upon executive officials daily. Abuses of power will be the final touch in preparing all institutions for their overthrow. Everything will then fall to pieces under the attacks of the angry mobs. Poverty is our weapon. Due to the ever-present threat of poverty, all people have been forced into working endlessly. They have been chained by slavery and serfdom. Well, perhaps they could save enough money to escape from their daily grind, but they would never have enough to afford what they truly want. We included some rights for the people into the Constitution which are fictitious and are not actual rights. All these so-called people's rights can exist only as an idea, an idea which can never be realized in practical life. How does it help the low-class laborer if people are given freedom of speech but only use it to babble? Or if journalists have the right to scribble any nonsense side by side with good works? The laborer gains nothing from this because he still must work such as before. He gains nothing from the Constitution other than the few pitiful crumbs which we fling at him from our tables in exchange for his voting in favor of what we dictate, in favor of the men whom we place in power, who are the servants of our specialist agents. Constitutional rights for a poor man are no more than a bitter piece of irony, because the fact that he must toil almost all day, gives him no time to use them. On the other hand, it robs him of any guarantee of regular and certain earnings by making him susceptible to strikes by his comrades or lockouts by his masters. We support communism. The people under our guidance have annihilated their aristocracy, who were their one and only defense and foster mother, who could have worked for the sake of the people's advantage, and who were inseparably bound with the well-being of the people. Nowadays, with the destruction of the aristocracy, the people have fallen into the grip of merciless money-grubbing scoundrels who have laid a pitiless and cruel yoke upon the necks of the workers. We appear on the scene as alleged saviors of the worker from this oppression. Then we propose that he join the ranks of our fighting forces, socialists, anarchists, communists, to whom we always give support in accordance with an alleged brotherly rule of the solidarity of all humanity, of our social masonry. The aristocracy, which lawfully enjoyed the labor of the workers, was interested in seeing that the workers were well fed, healthy, and strong. We are interested in just the opposite, in the decline and killing of the goyim. Our power is in the chronic shortness of food and physical weakness of the worker, because by this he will become our slave. He will have neither the strength nor the energy nor the inclination to oppose us. Hunger surely gives, him more, gives us more authority to rule the worker than the legal authority given to the aristocracy by the rule of kings. We will highlight the differences of wealth between the rich and the poor. The one percenter against the 99 percenter. The emotions of envy and hatred, which will then arise in the poor, due to their want of the wealth, will be whipped into a mob frenzy. Through their hands we shall wipe out all those who hinder us on our way. When the hour strikes for our sovereign lord of the entire world to be crowned, it is these same hands which will sweep away everything that might be a hindrance to us and to our final goal of, instilling, of installing our King David. 
the goyim have lost the habit of thinking unless prompted by the suggestions of our specialists therefore they do not see the urgent necessity of what we when our kingdom comes shall adopt at once namely that it is essential to teach in national schools across the world one simple true piece of knowledge the basis of all knowledge and the knowledge of the structure of human life which is this social existence requires division of labor and consequently the division of men into classes and conditions it is essential for all to know that owing to differences in the occupations of humans there cannot be any equality among them someone that commits an act that compromises a whole class cannot be held as equal responsible before the law as compared to someone who affects only himself the true knowledge of the structure of society secrets which we keep from the goyim would reveal that positions of work must correspond with the education that was given to a worker otherwise they may suffer after a thorough study of this knowledge people will voluntarily submit to authority and accept whatever position is given to them by the state those people blindly believe what they read and print and given their present state of ignorance they possess a sense of blind hatred toward anyone who has more wealth or lives in better conditions than themselves hmm. they have no understanding of the purpose of social classes the Jews will be safe this hatred will st be still further magnified by the effects of an economic crisis which will halt trading on the exchanges and bring industry to a standstill we shall create this crisis by all the secret subterranean methods open to us and with the aid of gold which is all in our hands a universal economic crisis whereby we shall throw upon the streets whole mobs of workers simultaneously in all the countries of Europe these mobs will rush delightedly to shed the blood of those whom in the simplicity of their ignorance they have envied from an early age and whose property they will then be able to loot ours end quote, they will not touch because the moment of attack will be known to us and we shall take measures to protect our own we have demonstrated that progress will bring all of the goyim to the realm of reason our despotism will be precisely that for it will be known how by calculated severe measures to pacify all unrest and burn liberalism out of all institutions when the population realizes that the utopia of communism is not as advertised and that all of those promises of freedom and indulgences of wealth that they imagined were not there they will find themselves stuck like a blind man on a host of stumbling blocks they have rushed to find a guide they never had the sense to return to the former state and they have laid down their full sovereign powers at our feet remember the french revolution to which it was we who gave the prefix of great the secrets of, it, of its preparations are well known to us for it was wholly the work of our hands that set it into motion at the present day we are as an international force invincible because if attacked by some state we will be supported by other states the goyim people are rascals who bow down but to force but are merciless toward weaknesses in others unforgiving of their faults and enjoy committing crimes they cannot bear the contradictions of a free social system but are willing to become martyrs in the face of the violence of bold despotism it is those qualities that help us become independent the goyim people suffer patiently under the abuses of the worst dictators even while those dictators would have beheaded twenty of their kings why is it 
that the people are willing to put up with such abuse and with the execution of the aristocracy? It is because the dictators tell the people that these abuses that they are inflicting are done for the highest purposes to secure the welfare of the peoples, the international brotherhood of them all, their solidarity and equality of rights. Naturally, they do not tell these foolish people that this unification must be accomplished only under our sovereign rule. And thusly, the people condemn the upright and acquit the guilty, persuaded ever more and more that it can do whatever it wishes. Thanks to this state of things, the people are destroying every kind of stability and creating discord at every turn, at every moment. The word freedom brings out the communities of men to fight against every kind of force, against every kind of authority, even against God and the laws of nature. For this reason we, when we fully step into our kingdom, shall have to erase this word from the language of life, implying that freedom is a principle of brute force which turns mobs into bloodthirsty beasts. These beasts, it is true, fall asleep again once they have drunk their fill of blood, and at such time can easily be riveted into their chains. But if they are not given blood, they will not sleep and will continue to struggle. Protocol 4. Materialism to replace religion. Every republic passes through several stages. The first of these is the early days of mad raging by the blind mob, tossed here and there, to and fro. The second is demagoguery, which leads to anarchy, and that inevitably leads to despotism. This is not a legal and observable, and therefore responsible, type of despotism. Rather, it is a hidden form of despotism that is in the hands of some secret organization. This organization is unscrupulous because it works behind the backs of the people using agents who have no accountability and who do not serve the people, only the organization. These agents are continually changing and this benefits the organization because it does, ha it does give them special rewards for long times in service. Who or what has the ability to overthrow an invisible force? Because that is precisely what our force is. Gentile-based Freemasonry serves as a smoke screen for us and our plans. But the plan of action of our force, even its very existence, remains an unknown mystery to the ignorant masses. We shall destroy God. Even freedom might be harmless and have its place in our state economy without harming the well-being of the people if it is based on a faith in God and on the brotherhood of humanity, providing that it remains disconnected with the concept of equality. Equality is negated by the very laws of creation, for these laws have established subordination. With faith such as this, a people may be governed by a trusteeship of parishes and would walk contently and humbly under the guiding hand of its spiritual pastor while submitting to the plans of God upon earth. This is the reason why it is so essential for us to undermine all faith, to tear out of the mind of the Goyim and the principle of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to put in its place arithmetical calcu calculations and material needs. In order to give the Goyim no time to think and notice what is happening to them, their minds must be diverted towards industry and trade. Thus, all of the nations will be swallowed up in the pursuit of gain, and in the race for it, they will not notice their common enemy. But again, in order that freedom may once and for all disintegrate and ruin the communities of the Goyim, we must put industry on a speculative basis. 
the result of this will be that the wealth which is mined from the earth will not be invested in productive industry, no, 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 but will pass to institutions that deal in speculation, financial gambling as it is, which are under our complete control and ownership. The intensified struggle for superiority and the shocks delivered to economic life will create no, have already created disenchanted, cold, and heartless communities and corporations. Such communities will lose interest in and foster a strong aversion towards sound political management and religion. Their only guide will be that of monetary gain, gold, which they will erect onto a bona fide cult for the sake of those material delights which it can give. Then a day of reckoning will come when, not for the sake of righteousness, not even to win wealth, but solely out of hatred towards those privileged, the lower classes of the Goyim will follow our lead and rise against our rivals for power, the intellectuals of the Goyim. Protocol number five, despotism and modern progress. What form of administrative rule can be given to communities in which corruption has penetrated everywhere? Communities where riches are obtained only by the clever surprise tactics of con artists, where looseness reigns, where morality is maintained not by voluntarily accepted principles, but by harsh laws and strong enforcement where feelings towards religion and country are obligated only by fashionable persuasions. What form of rule is to be given to these communities other than that of despotism, which I shall describe to you later? We shall create a strong central government in order to gain a stranglehold on those communities. We shall thoroughly regulate all aspects of the public life of our subjects with new laws. These laws will withdraw one by one. All the privileges and freedoms which have been permitted to the Goyim, and our kingdom will be distinguished by a despotism of such magnificent proportion that at any moment and in every place it will be in a position to wipe out any Goyim who dares to oppose us, either in words or by actions. You may think that for a despotism of this description to come into being, it would not be consistent with the progress of history, and that it could not exist in this modern age, but I will prove to you that it is and that it could. Back in the days when the peoples looked at kings on their thrones, just as they would look upon a pure manifestation of the will of God, they submitted without a murmur to the despotic power of their kings. But from the day when we placed the concept of their own rights into their minds, they began to regard the occupants of thrones as mere ordinary mortals. The godlike charm of the Lord's anointed has fallen from the heads of kings in the eyes of the people. And when we also robbed them of their faith in God, the might of authoritative power fell into the realm of public ownership, and it was then seized by us, the Jews. Masses led by lies. Moreover, the art of directing masses and individuals by means of cleverly manipulated theory and words, by laws, and by all sorts of other odd methods. The Goyim understand none of this because it belongs to the specialists of our collective governing intelligence. Reared on, anal on analysis, observation, and delicate calculations. In this type of skill we have no rivals any more than we have rivals in the drawing up of plans of political intrigue, actions, and of solidarity. In this respect the Roman Catholic Church may have been compared with us, but we have conspired to discredit them in the eyes of the unthinking mob since they are an observable organization, why we ourselves have kept our secret organization in the shade the whole time. However, 
It is probably all the same to the world, which does not really care who its sovereign lord is, whether the head of Catholicism or our despot of the blood of Zion. But it is we, the chosen people, to whom it is very far from being a matter of indifference. For a time, perhaps, we might, have, we might be successfully dealt with by a coalition of the goyim of the entire world, but we are protected from this danger by the discord existing amongst them. Their loyalties to their own separate groups, races, and classes are now so deeply ingrained that they can never be removed. We have set one against each other. The personal and national beliefs of the Goyim, religious and racial hatreds, which we have fostered into a huge growth in the course of the past 20 centuries. This is the reason why there is not one state which would anywhere receive support if it were to raise its arm, for every one of them must bear in mind that any agreement against us would be unprofitable to itself. We are too strong, and there is no evading our power. The nations cannot come to even an inconsiderable private con agreement without our secretly having a hand in it. Quote, per me reges regnat, end quote, is Latin for, quote, it is through me that kings reign, end quote. And it was said by the prophets that we were chosen by God himself to rule over the whole of the earth. God has endowed us with genius so that we may do this task given to us. If genius was in an opposing camp, it would still struggle against us. But even so, a newcomer is no match for the old established settler. The struggle would be merciless between us, such a fight as the world has never before seen. Yes, and the genius on their side would have arrived too late. All the wheels of the machinery of all states go via the force of the engine, which is in our hands, and that engine of the machinery of states is gold. The science of political economy, invented by our learned elders, has placed great value on the importance of money capital for such a very long time. Monopoly capital. Capital if it is to function without limitations, must be free to establish a monopoly of industry and trade. This is already being put into place by an unseen hand in all quarters of the world. This freedom will give political strength to those engaged in industry, and that will help us to oppress the people. Nowadays it is more important to disarm the peoples than to lead them into war. If those people have a passion that has suddenly burst into flames, it is more important to use it to our advantage than it is to quench it. Finally, it is more important to eradicate them. The principal goal of our directors consists of this, to weaken the public mind by criticism, to lead it away from serious reflections which may arouse calculated resistance, and to distract the forces of the mind towards meaningless fights. Throughout history, the people of the world have accepted campaign promises at face value. Those people are content with the show and rarely pause to check afterward whether the promises have been kept. The same holds true for individuals outside the political arena. Such is the way of the stupid Goyim. Therefore, we shall establish show institutions, which will give eloquent proof of their benefit to progress. We shall assume to ourselves to represent the voice of freedom of all parties, of all directions, and we shall make our representative be a voice in orators, who will speak so much that they will exhaust the patience of their hearers and bring about a hatred of oratory. In order to put public opinion into our hands, we must bring it into a state of bewilderment by, by broadcasting so many contradictory opinions from all sides and for such a long time that it will make the Goyim lose their heads in a maze of confusion. They will come to realize that the best thing is to have no opinion of any kind in political matters, 
especially when it is intended that the public should not understand the issues being discussed. In that way, the useless and stupid Goyim will leave the opinions and understanding of the issues to those who guide the public. This is the first secret. The second secret necessity for the success of our government consists of the following. To emphasize the national failings of bad habits, misplaced passions, and troubling conditions of everyday life to such an extent that it will be impossible for anyone to know whether he is where he is in the resulting chaos. As a result, the people will fail to understand one another. This measure will also serve us in another way namely to sow discord in all parties, to dislocate all collective forces which are still unwilling to submit to us, and to discourage any kind of personal initiative which might hinder our affairs in any way, shape, or form. There is nothing more dangerous than personal initiative. If it has genius behind it, such initiative can do more harm than can be done by millions of people among whom we have sown discord. We must direct the education of the Goyim communities such that whenever they come upon a matter requiring initiative they throw up their hands in despairing impotence. The strain which results from lack of achievement saps the spirit when compared side by side with the accomplishments of a successful person. From this comparison arises grave moral shocks disenchantments and failures. By all these means we shall so wear down the Goyim that they will be compelled to offer us international power of a nature that by its position will enable us without any violence gradually to absorb all the state forces of the world and to form a super government, our new world order. In place of the rulers of today we shall set up a monstrosity called the Super Government Administration. Its tentacles will reach out in all directions, like grappling hooks, and its organization will be of such colossal dimensions that it cannot fail to subdue all the nations of the world. Protocol 6 Takeover Technique we shall soon begin to establish huge monopolies, reservoirs of colossal riches, upon which even large fortunes of the Goyim will depend to such an extent that they will go to the bottom together with the credit of the state on the day after the political crash. You gentlemen here that are economists, just make an estimate of the significance of this combination. In every possible way, we must show the importance of our super-government by presenting it as a protector and benefactor of all those who voluntarily submit to us. The aristocracy of the Goyim as a political force is dead. We need not take it into account, but as landed proprietors, they can still be harmful to us from the fact that they are self-sufficient in their resources upon which they live. Hmm. It is essential, therefore, for us at whatever cost to deprive them of their land. This object will be best attained by increasing the burdens upon landed property, by loading lands with debt, for instance. These measures will reduce land ownership and keep it in a state of humble and unconditional submission. The aristocrats of the Goyim, being incapable of contenting themselves with little, due to their upbringing, will rapidly burn up and fizzle out. We shall enslave Gentiles. At the same time, we must intensively promote trade and industry, but firstly and foremostly speculation. The part played by speculation is to suppress industry. The absence of speculative industry will multiply capital in private hands and will serve to restore agriculture by freeing the land from the debts of the banks. 
What we want is that industry should drain both labor and capital from the land, taken by means of speculation, transfer all the money of the world into our hands, and thereby throw all the goyim into the ranks of the working class. Then, and only then, will the goyim bow down before us, if for no other reason but to get the very right to exist. To complete the ruin of the industry of the goyim, which we shall bring to the assistance of the speculation, the luxury which we have encouraged amongst the goyim, that greedy demand for luxury which is swallowing up everything. We shall raise the rate of wages. However, this will not bring any advantage to the workers, because at the same time we shall also cause a rise in prices of items that are essential to life. Hmm. We shall claim that these increases were caused by a decline in agriculture and cattle breeding. We shall craftily and thoroughly further undermine sources of production by accustoming the workers to anarchy and to drunkenness. Additionally, we shall take all measures to uproot all the education, educated forces of the goyim from the face of the earth. In order that the true meaning of things is not discovered by the goyim before the proper time, we shall mask it under an alleged enthusiastic desire to serve the working classes and the great principles of political economy which our economic theories carry with much energetic propaganda. Protocol 7. Worldwide Wars. The increase in size of the military, political forces, and of their armaments are all essential for the completion of the above plans. The situation we need to arrive at is that the populations of the world's nations consist of only 1. Ourselves, 2. The masses of the working class, 3. A few non-Jewish millionaires devoted to our interests, and four, police and soldiers. Throughout all of Europe and countries that have relations with Europe, and in other continents as well, we must create unrest, disagreement, and open hostility. This gives us a double advantage. Firstly, it deters countries from acting against us, for they will know that we have the power to create disorders or to restore order whenever we like. Occupy movement. <clears throat> All these countries will see us as an unavoidable force of authority. Secondly, if we threaten to withdraw or muddle up our existing arrangements with these countries, this would also create havoc and chaos. You see, over many years we have inserted ourselves into the administrative machinery of their cabinets, making them vitally dependent upon us Jews. In order to infiltrate in this manner, we must involve ourselves in matters like economic treaties or loan obligations. We need to use great cunning during negotiations and agreements, but instead of using our usual threatening language, we'll instead do the opposite and don the mask of honesty and complacency. In this way, the peoples and governments of the Goyim, whom we have taught to look at only the outside of whatever we present to their notice, will continue to accept us as the benefactors and saviors of the human race. Hmm. Universal War if any country dares to oppose us, we must be in a position to respond by way of war. We will do this by teaming up with the neighbors of that country. But if those neighbors should also venture to stand collectively together against us, then we must resist with a universal war. The main factor of success in politics is to operate in secrecy. A diplomat must say one thing, but then do another. We must compel the governments of the Goyim to take action in the direction favored by our well-thought-out plans, which is nearing completion, and what we shall claim is public opinion. This opinion will be secretly promoted by us through means of that so-called 
great power. The media, which apart from a few unimportant exceptions, is already entirely in our hands. In order to display our system of keeping the governments of the Goyim in Europe in check, we shall show our strength by committing terrorist attacks against one of them. If the governments of Europe should collectively rise against us, we shall respond using the military might of America or China or Japan. Protocol 8. Provisional Government. We must arm ourselves with all the weapons which our opponents might use against us. We need to make our actions look valid and proper from a legal viewpoint. Occasionally, we'll pronounce judgments that might appear biased or unjust, so we need to brush up on our legal poetry to make our arguments sound convincing, because it's important that we get our judgments passed. NDAA, SOPA, NAFTA, Patriot Act, etc., etc. We will use expressions that sound like the most exalted moral principles converted into a legal form. Our directors must surround themselves with everyone that they need to do their work. They will surround themselves with publicists, practical jurists, administrators, diplomats, and finally with persons prepared by a special super education training in our special schools. These persons will have a clear understanding of the secrets of how society works. They will understand the special language of politics and how that language can be manipulated. They will may be made acquainted with the whole underside of human nature, with all of its weaknesses and sensitive chords upon which they will need to play. These chords represent the mindset of the Goyim, their tendencies, shortcomings, vices, and qualities, and the particularities of their classes and conditions. Needless to say that the talented assistants of authority of whom I speak will not be selected from amongst the Goyim, who are accustomed to doing their administrative work without ever troubling themselves to think about what it is for or why it is needed. The administrators of the Goyim sign papers without reading them. These administrators serve us either for their pay or for personal ambition. We shall surround our government with a whole world of economists. This is the reason why economic sciences are the main subject that is taught to the Jews. Around us again will be a whole constellation of bankers, industrialists, capitalists, and the main thing millionaires, because for the main part everything will be settled by the question of large amounts of money which we control. For the time being, until we get to the point where there is no longer any risk in entrusting responsible positions in our state to our brother Jews, we shall put them in the hands of persons who have a criminal past and have shown little regard for the welfare of the people. Persons who, if they disobey our instructions, must face criminal charges or simply disappear. In this, will, in this way, we will make them defend our interests to their last gasping breath. Protocol 9. Re-education. In applying our principles, please take note of the character of the people in whose country you live and act. We must adjust our methods to suit, because a general, identical application of our principles to all cultures cannot succeed, at least not until the people have been re-educated to conform to our pattern. But by approaching their application cautiously, you will see that, in less than a decade, even the most stubborn character will change and we shall add a new people to the ranks of those already subdued by us. The words of the libertarian, liberty, equality, fraternity, which are really just rallying cries invented by us, Jews, will, when we come into our kingdom, be changed by us into words that are no longer used to rally support, but only an expression of idealism, namely into, quote, 
the right of liberty, the duty of equality, the ideal of brotherhood. End quote. That's how we shall put it. We shall catch the bull by the horns and turn those words to our advantage. We have effectively already wiped out every kind of rule except our own, although legally there still remains quite a lot of them. Nowadays, if any states protest against us, it is only done according to our planning, at our discretion, and by our direction, for their anti-Semitism is an essential way for us to manage our lesser brethren Jews. Hmm. I will not talk further on this topic, because this matter has already been discussed at length many times before now. The Jewish Superstate There is nothing to limit the range of our activities. Our super-government exists within special legal conditions which are commonly referred to by the energetic and forcible word dictatorship. I am in a position to tell you with clear conscience that when the time is right we, the lawgivers, shall execute judgment and sentence. We shall slay and we shall spare. We, as head of all of our troops, are following the lead of our dynamic ruler. We rule by force of will because in our hands are the fragments of a once powerful party, now vanquished by us. And the weapons in our hands are limitless ambitions, burning greediness, merciless vengeance, hatreds, and malice. It is from us that the all-engulfing terror proceeds. We have at our service persons of all opinions, of all doctrines, restorative monarchists, demagogues, socialists, communists, and all utopian dreamers of every kind. We have harnessed them all to the task. Each one of them is independently chiseling away at the last remnants of authority, is striving to overthrow all established forms of order. By these acts, all states are experiencing torture. They cry out for tranquility and are ready to sacrifice everything for peace. But we will not give them peace until they openly acknowledge our international supergovernment and with submissiveness. The people have howled about the necessity of settling the issue of socialism by way of international agreement. Their division into political parties has given us complete control over them, because in order to carry out on a contested struggle, one must have money, and the money is all in our hands. We might have reason to prevent a union forming between the clear-sighted force of the Goy kings on their thrones and the blind force of the Goy mobs, but we have taken all necessary measures against any such possibility. Between the one and the other force we have erected a wall in the form of a mutual terror between them. In this way the blind force of the people remains in our side, and we, and we only, shall provide them with a the leader, and of course direct them along the road that leads to our goal. In order that the hand of the blind mob may not free itself from our guiding hand, we must every now and then enter into a close rapport with them, either in person or through some of the, our most trustworthy brethren. Once we are acknowledged as the only authority, we shall discuss with the people personally on the market, places, and we shall instruct them on how to enter into politics in such a way as may turn them in the direction that suits us. Who is going to verify what is taught in the village schools? We cannot allow the words of government representatives or of a king himself to become immediately known to the whole state, because it will spread far and wide by the voice of the people. In order to destroy the educational institutions of the Goyim, while we still can, we have infiltrated them with great cunning, and have taken hold of their syllabi. Their syllabi were once laid out in careful consideration, but we have 
replaced them by the chaotic ideas of liberalism. We have gotten our hands into the administration of the law, into the conduct of elections, into the press, into liberty of the person, but principally into education and training as being the cornerstones of a free existence. Christian youth destroyed. We have fooled, bemused, and corrupted the youth of the Goyim by rearing them in principles and theories which are known to us to be false. And we have taught this through repetition. We have taken the existing laws and have twisted them into contradictions of interpretations without substantially altering them. Doing this has produced wonderful results. These results are that these laws were effectively destroyed owing to the fact that the interpretations of the law masked the intent of the law. Eventually, these interpretations entirely hid these laws from the eyes of the governments owing to the impossibility of making anything out of the tangled web of legislation. This is the origin of the theory of arbitration. You may say that the Goyim will rise up against us, guns in hand, if they guess what is going on before the time comes for our complete domination. But in the West we have a maneuver against this of such appalling terror that would cause even the very hardest of hearts to convulse in fear. The undergrounds those subterranean corridors which lie beneath the capitals. Before the time comes, those capitals will be blown into the air with all their organizations and archives. Protocol 10. Preparing for Power Today I begin with a repetition of what I said before now. And I begin and I beg you to bear in mind that governments and people are content with the outside appearances of their political process. And how indeed are the goyim to see the deeper meanings of things when their representatives are mainly focused on enjoying themselves? For our policy it is of the greatest importance to be aware of this fact. It will be of assistance to us when we come to consider how to delegate the proper authority in matters of property, of housing, of taxation, including the idea of concealed taxes, and of the automatic enforcement of those laws. All these questions are such that they should not be touched upon or debated directly in public. In cases where it is necessary to touch upon them, the details of those cases must not specifically be discussed. It must merely be declared that the principles of current law are acknowledged by us. The reason for keeping silent in this respect is that by not naming a principle, we leave ourselves some freedom to drop this or that out of it without attracting notice. If the principles of law we were supposed to be following were all categorically named, they would then appear to have been proven true. The mob cherishes a special affection and respect for the geniuses of political power and accept all of their deeds of violence with the admiring response, quote, Unscrupulous? Well, yes, it is unscrupulous, but it's clever. A mischievous trick, if you like, but how craftily played, how magnificently done, what barefaced daring, end quote. Our goal, world power and domination. We depend upon attracting all nations to the task of building our new political structure. The project plan for this has been drawn up by us. This is why, before everything, it is absolutely essential for us to arm ourselves and to install in ourselves that absolutely reckless daring and unstoppable motivation which will break down all hindrances on our way. When we have accomplished our government overthrow, we shall then say to the various peoples, quote, 
Everything has gone terribly wrong. Everyone has been worn out with suffering. We are destroying the causes of your torment. Nationalities, borders, different currencies. You are free, of course, to pronounce sentence upon us. But can it possibly be a just one if you pronounce it before you properly try out what we are offering you? End quote. Then the mob will praise us and give us their support and a unanimous triumph of hopes and expectations. Voting, which we have made the instrument that will set us on the throne of the world by teaching even the very smallest units of members of the human race to vote by means of meetings and agreements by groups, will then have served its purposes and will play its part then for the last time by a unanimity of desire to make close acquaintance with us before condemning us. To secure this, we must have everyone vote without regard to their social class or qualifications in order to establish an absolute majority which cannot get from the educated wealthy classes. In this way, by impressing in all a sense of self-importance, we shall destroy among the Goyim the importance of the family and its educational value and remove the possibility of individual minds splitting off because, you see, the mob majority who is handled by us will not let them come to the front nor even give them a hearing. It is accustomed to listening to us only who pay it for obedience and attention. In this way we shall create a blind, mighty force which shall never be in a position to move in any direction without the guidance of our agents set at its head by us as leaders of that mob. The people will submit to this regime because it knows that it will depend upon these leaders for its earnings, gratifications, and the receipt of all kinds of benefits. A scheme of government should come ready-made from one brain because it will never be quenched firmly if it is allowed to split into fractional parts in the minds of many. It is allowable, therefore, for us to have knowledge of the scheme of action, but not to discuss it lest we disturb its cunning. The interdependence of its component parts and the practical force behind the secret meaning of each clause. To discuss and make alterations in this manner by means of much voting gives those alterations the appearance of having been arrived at by the process of logical and methodical reasoning, and any misunderstandings of these alterations will prevent the public from seeing into the next connected link of our scheme. We want our schemes to be forcible and suitably devised. Therefore, we ought not to let our well-thought-out plans be revealed to the public as a whole, or even to a select group of them. These schemes will not turn existing institutions up to upside down just yet. They will only affect changes in their economy, and consequently in the whole combined movement of their progress, which will then be directed along the paths laid down in our schemes. The poison of liberalism. In each country there exists a group of governing bodies. They go under various names, but they are essentially the same thing, namely representation, ministry, senate, state council, legislative and executive corps. I needn't explain how these institutions relate to one another, because you are no doubt aware of all of that. But take note of the fact that each of the above named institutions corresponds to some important function of the state. And by important, I do not mean the institution itself, but its function. Example, it's not the institutions that are important, but it's their functions that are vital. These institutions have divided up among themselves all the functions of government, administrative, 
legislative, executive, and they operate together in much the same way as organs in the human body operate. If we injure one part of the machinery of state, the state falls sick, like a human body, and will eventually die. When we introduced into the state organism the poison of liberalism, its whole political complexion changed. States have been seized with a mortal illness, a blood poisoning. All that remains is to wait the end of their death agony. Liberalism produced constitutional states, which took the place of what was the only safeguard of the goyim, namely monarchical despotism. And a constitution, as you well know, is nothing but a system of strife, misunderstandings, quarrels, disagreements, fruitless party agitations, party whims. In a word, a system of everything that serves to destroy the personality of state activity. The tribe of the talking heads has no less effectively than the press condemned the rulers to inactivity and impotence, and thereby render them useless and superfluous. And this is the reason why they have been removed from office in so many countries. At that point, the era of republics could come into being, and then we replaced the ruler with a mockery of a government by a president taken from the mob, from the midst of our puppet creatures, our slaves, our goyim. This was the foundation of the time bomb which we placed under the goy people, or I should rather say, under the goy peoples. Soon we shall assign the duties of presidents. By that time, we shall be in a position to disregard the procedures normally required to accomplish our necessary tasks, because our impersonal puppet will be able to do it directly. What do we care if the ranks of those striving for power should be weakened, if a deadlock arises from the impossibility of finding presidents, a deadlock which will finally disorganize the country? In order that our scheme may produce this result, we shall arrange elections in favor of such presidents who have some dark, undiscovered disgrace in their past, some sinister secret. Then they will be trustworthy agents for the accomplishment of our plans out of fear of revelations and from the natural desire of everyone who has attained power, namely the retention of its privileges, advantages, and honor connected with the office of president. The Chamber of Deputies will provide cover for, will protect, and will elect presidents, but we shall take from it the right to propose new laws or make changes to existing laws, for this right will be given by us to the president, who is really just a puppet in the hands of the Jews. Naturally, the authority of the presidents will then become a target for every possible form of attack, but we shall provide him with a means of self-defense and the right of an appeal to the people. The decision of the people outranks the decision of the representatives who may wish to oppose the president, so that appeal will go to a blind slave of ours, the majority of the mob. Independently of this, we shall give the president the right of declaring a state of war. We shall justify this last right on the ground that the president, as chief of the whole army of the country, must have access to that right in case he needs to defend the new Republican Constitution. That right to defend will belong to him as the responsible representative of this Constitution. It should be easy to understand that under these conditions the magic lamp will be in our hands and no one other than us will, will any longer have control over determining legislation. Besides this, we shall, with the introduction of the new Republican Constitution, taken from the chamber the right of inserting new legislation on government measures on the pretext of preserving national security, and further, we shall use the new constitution to reduce the number of representatives to a minimum. 
thereby proportionately reducing political passions and the passion for politics. If, however, these passions should burst into flame, which is hardly to be expected, not even to a small degree, we shall nullify them by a stirring appeal and making a reference to the majority opinion of the voting population. The President will have the power to appoint the Presidents and Vice Presidents of the Chamber and of the Senate. Instead of constant sessions of Parliaments, we shall reduce their sittings to a few months. Moreover, the President, as Chief of the Executive Power, will have the right to summon and dissolve Parliament, and in the latter case, to prolong the time for the appointment of a new Parliamentary Assembly. These presidential actions may be considered illegal, and as a result, the representatives and public might then start attacking the President. This could be a problem for our plans if it happened prematurely. In order to avoid the blame from being pushed onto the President, we shall encourage ministers and other officials of the higher administration to evade his plans by taking actions of their own. In doing so, they will be made scapegoats in his place. This part we especially recommend should be played by the Senate, the Council of State, or the Council of Ministries, but not by an individual official. The President will, at our discretion, interpret the meaning of existing laws and point out that there are already various interpretations of them. He will further annul them when we indicate to him the necessity to do so. Besides this, he will have the right to propose temporary laws, executive orders, and even new departures in the government's constitutional working. The pretext both for doing these things will be the requirements for the supreme welfare of the state. We shall destroy. By these actions we shall obtain the power of destroying the constitutions of the states. We shall do this by introducing into those constitutions, little by little, slowly by slowly, step by step, all those things which we have determined are our rights from the outset. This will cause an imperceptible abolition of every kind of constitution, and then the time will have come to turn every form of government into our despotism. The recognition of our despot may also come before the destruction of the Constitution. The moment for this recognition will come when the peoples, utterly wearied by the irregularities and incompetence, a matter which we shall have arranged for, will exclaim of their rulers, it, quote, Away with them, and give us one king over all the earth, who will unite us and annihilate the causes of our disorders frontiers, nationalities, religions, and state debts. Who will give us peace and quiet which we cannot find under our rulers and representatives?" End quote. But you yourselves know perfectly well that to produce the possibility of the expression of such wishes by all the nations, is necess it is necessary to trouble the people's relations with their governments in all countries to such a degree that it will utterly exhaust humanity with dissension, hatred, struggle, envy, and even by the uses of torture, starvation, spreading of diseases, and or extreme poverty. As a result of all of this, the Goyim will see no other solution than to take refuge in our complete sovereignty, in our money, and in all else that we offer. But if we give the nations of the world a breathing space, the moment we long for is hardly ever likely to arrive. Protocol 11. The Totalitarian State The State Council has been made a clear-cut example of the authority of the ruler. It will represent the show part of the legislative corps, 
who will be in charge of putting the laws and decrees into writing. This is now the program of the new Constitution. We shall make laws, rights and justice, one, in the form of proposals to the legislative corps, two, by decrees of the President under the guise of general regulations, three, by orders of the Senate, four, by resolutions of the State Council in the guise of ministerial orders, five, and finally, in case a suitable occasion should arise, in the form of a revolution within the State. Now that we've basically established how we're going to operate, let's look into the details of what we need to do to complete the revolution by moving the various State Departments into the appropriate direction. These details will involve knowing how to use and manipulate many political aspects, including the freedom of the press, the rights of association, freedom of conscience, the voting principle, and many other things which must forever disappear from people's memories or which must undergo a radical alteration the day after the new Constitution is officially announced. We need to introduce many new laws, and the best time to announce them is now rather than later. The reason for this is, if we bring in new laws after the time when we have fully come into power, then people will be fearful of them and may reject them. Because, you see, after that time there will be a period of harsh severity and limitations, and any additional restrictive laws will make the people feel that things are just getting worse. If the only way to bring in these new laws is to discard some of our existing laws, then this will give the wrong impression, like we have recognized our own wrongdoing. This will damage our image as a figure of faultless authority. We'll get no thanks for this because people will assume that backing off is our authority. Both of the two above scenarios would damage the prestige of the new Constitution. From the moment that it is announced, and while the peoples of the world are still stunned by the fact that a revolution has taken place and are still in a condition of terror and uncertainty, what we want is that they should recognize once and for all that we are so strong, so unbeatable, so super abundantly filled with power that in no case shall we take any of their objections into consideration. And that we are so far from paying any attention to their opinions or wishes that we are ready and able to crush all forms of expression with irresistible power. At every moment and in every place we will have seized everything that we wanted all at once, and in no case shall we share our power with them. Then in fear and trembling they will close their eyes into everything, and be content to wait what will be the end of it all. We are wolves. The Goyim are but a flock of sheep, and we are their wolves. And you know what happens when the wolves get a hold of the flock. There is also another reason why they will close their eyes, for we shall keep promising to give back all of those liberties that we have taken away from them, just as soon as we have defeated what we claim are the enemies of peace and have everyone under control. It is not worth saying anything about how long they will be kept waiting for this return of their liberties. Why have we invented this whole policy and cunningly inserted it into the minds of the Goyim without giving them any chance of examining its underlying meaning? And why have we taken such a roundabout way to obtain things for our scattered tribe of Jews? Well, because we couldn't have done it directly. Because we could not have done it directly. This has served as the basis for our organization of secret Freemasonry, which is not known to, and has aims which are not, even so much as, sus as suspected by the Goyim. These Goyim cattle are attracted to us into the show army of Masonic lodges in order to feel superior to and look down upon their fellow Goyim. 
God has granted to us, his chosen people, the gift of spreading ourselves widely throughout the world. To most people, this appears to be our weakness, but, as it happens, this has brought forth our strength, and now we are on the threshold of sovereignty over the entire world. There is not much remaining for us to do in terms of building up the foundation which we have laid for our plans. Protocol 12. The Control of the Media The word freedom, which can be interpreted in various ways, is defined by us as follows. Freedom is the right to do what the law allows. This interpretation of the word will, at the proper time, be of service to us because all freedom will then be in our hands, since the laws will abolish or create only what is desirable for us according to the above mentioned program. We shall deal with the media in the following way. What is the role played by the media today? It sometimes serves to excite and inflame those passions which are needed for our purpose, and at other times it serves the selfish desires of other parties. It is too often bland, unjust, dishonest, and the majority of the public haven't the slightest idea what purpose the media truly serves. We shall saddle it and bridle it with a tight chain. We shall also do the same with all other productions of the printing pr press, for what would the sense be of getting rid of attacks from newspapers if we remain the targets via pamphlets and books? The output of the media is nowadays a source of heavy expense owing to the necessity of censoring it. We will turn it into a very lucrative source of income to our state by laying a special stamp tax on it and requiring deposits of caution money before permitting any new media companies from being established. They will then be required to guarantee our government against any kind of attack from their media. For any attempt to attack us, if that is still possible, we shall inflict fines without mercy. Such measures as stamp tax, deposits of caution money, and fines secured by these deposits will bring in a huge income to our government. It is true that political groups which have money to spare might still attack us for the sake of publicity regardless of these fines, but these we shall shut up at the second attack upon us. No one shall lay a finger on the aura of our government infallibility without being punished. The pretext for stopping any publication will be the alleged plea that it is agitating or inflaming the public mind without any good reason or at any appropriate time. I beg you to note that among those making attacks upon us will also be entities established by us, but they will only attack points of our plan which we have already decided to alter. We control the media. Not a single announcement will reach the public without our control. Even now this is being achieved by us due to the fact that all news items are received by only a few agencies and their offices are a focal point for news coming in from all around the world. These agencies will already be entirely owned by us and will only publish what we dictate to them. We have effectively taken possession of the minds of the Goyim communities to such an extent that they will have to come to look upon the events of the world through the colored glasses which we have placed upon their noses. Already now there is not a single state which has barriers preventing us from gaining access to what Goyim stupidly call quote, state secrets. End quote. What will our positions be when we are acknowledged as supreme lords of the world and have one of our persons as the king of all of the world? Let's turn again to the future of the printing press. Everyone desirous of being a publisher, librarian, or printer will be obliged to first acquire a special license for that purpose, which in case of any fault will be immediately suspended. 
With such measures, the thoughts of the people will be under the control of our government, who will educate them appropriately, and will not allow the masses to be led along different paths, and by fantasies about the blessings of progress. All of us here know that these delusional blessings give rise to fanciful dreaming, which leads to anarchy among the people, and those towards authority. This is a very bad thing, because progress, or rather the idea of progress, has brought forth all sorts of ideas about gaining freedoms, but has failed to establish its limits. All the so-called libertarians are anarchists, either in thought or in reality. Every one of them, in hunting for the phantoms of freedom, ends up involved in anarchy, and protests just for the sake of protesting. Free Press Destroyed We turn now to the periodical press. We shall impose on it, and on all printed matter, stamp taxes per sheet and deposits of caution money. Books of less than thirty sheets will pay double. We shall classify them as pamphlets for two reasons. Firstly, to reduce the number of magazines, because these are the worst form of printed poison, and, secondly, to force writers to make such lengthy productions that they will be little read, especially seeing that they will also be made costly. At the same time, what we shall publish as pamphlets ourselves to influence mental developments in the desired direction. These pamphlets will be cheap and eagerly read by the stupid masses, and they will also bring us some profits. The tax will bring uninteresting literary ambitions within reach, and the risk of possible penalties will make literary men dependent upon us. And if anyone is desirous of writing against us, they will not find any person eager to put their productions into print, because the publisher or printer will first have to apply to the authorities for permission to do so. Thusly, we shall have advanced knowledge of all tricks being prepared against us, and shall nullify them by getting in ahead with our explanations on the subject or subjects being discussed. Literature and journalism are two of the very most important educative forces, and therefore our government will become pri proprietor of the majority of the journals. This will neutralize the injurious influence of the privately owned press, and will put us in position of a tremendous influence upon the public mind. If we give permits for ten privately owned journals, we shall establish thirty journals of our own, and so forth and so on, in the same proportion. This, however, must be in no way suspected by the public. For this reason, all journals published by us will be very opposite in appearance, tendencies, and opinions to our official stance. This will create confidence in our journals bringing over to us quite unsuspicious opponents who will thus fall into our trap and be rendered harmless. We will divide our media components into three layers or ranks. In the first rank will be publications of an official Nick character. They will always stand guard over our interests, and therefore their influence will be comparatively insignificant. In the second rank, will be the semi-official publications, whose part it will be to normally support us and sometimes criticize us, but only over issues of lukewarm importance. In the third rank, we shall set up what looks like our own opposing camp, which, in at least one of its publications, will present what looks like the very enemy of us in our goal. Our true opponents at heart will accept this simulated opposition as their own, and will reveal their identities and plans to us. Hmm. Infowars. Our newspapers will be of all possible complexions, aristocratic, republican, revolutionary, even anarchical, and only as long, of course, as the Constitution exists, 
like the Indian idol Vishnu, they will have 100 hands, and every one of them will have a finger on any one of the public opinions as required. When an emotive issue arises, these hands will lead opinion in the direction of our aims, for an excited person loses all power of judgment and easily yields to suggestion. Those fools who will think that they are repeating the opinion of a newspaper of their own camp will actually be repeating our opinion or any opinion that seems desirable to us. In the vain belief that they are following the ideology of their party, they will in fact be following the flag that we have hung out for them. In order to direct our newspaper militia in this way, we must take special and minute care in organizing this matter. Under the title of Central Department of the Media, we shall arrange literary gatherings at which our agents will, without attracting attention, issue the orders and specify the, quote, important issues, end quote, of the day which journalists need to cover. By superficially discussing and opposing, but without touching the essence of the matter, our appointed people will carry on sham fights and arguments with the official newspapers solely for the purpose of giving us a reason to express ourselves more fully than we ever could have done from the outset in official announcements, whenever, of course, that is to our advantage. Mm -mm -mm. These attacks upon us will also serve another purpose, namely that our subjects will be convinced of the existence of full freedom of speech, and this gives our agents an occasion to claim that all publications which oppose us are empty babblers, and since they are incapable of finding any substantial objections to our orders, are rendered impotent. Only lies printed. Methods of organization like these, which are imperceptible to the public eye, but are sure to work, are calculated as being the best way to succeed in bringing the attention and the confidence of the public to the side of our government. Thanks to such methods, we shall be in a position, as may be required from time to time, to excite or calm the public mind on political questions to persuade or to confuse, sometimes printing truth, sometimes lies, facts or their contradictions. We will do this according on how well the messages are received, and always very cautiously feeling the ground before stepping upon it. We shall have an assured victory over our opponents, since they will not have the appropriate access to the media in which they can give full and final expression to their views, owing to the above-mentioned methods of dealing with the media. We shall not even need to refute them, except so very superficially. Trial shots like these, fired by us in the third rank of our press, will, when necessary, be energetically refuted by us in our semi-official publications. Even nowadays, already, to take only the French press as one example, there are groups which reveal Masonic-like solidarity and acting together on the, quote, important issues, end quote. All people of the media are bound together by professional secrecy and, like the priests of ancient Rome, not one of them will give away the secret of his sources of information unless the group agrees upon it. Not one journalist will venture to betray this secret, for not one of them is ever admitted to practice journalism unless his whole past has some dark and disgraceful secret in it. For if he did, those secrets would be immediately revealed. So long as they remain the secret of a few, the prestige of the journalist allows him to attack the majority of the country, and the mob will follow him with great enthusiasm. Our mischievous plans are also designed to apply to the rural areas. It is essential for us to stir up there those hopes and impulses which, at any given moment, we could also stir up in the major cities and urban areas. 
we shall tell the people of those cities that these expressions are the independent hopes and impulses of the royal of the rural people naturally the source of them will always be one and the same ours what we need is that until such time as we have the majority of power the cities should find themselves stifled by the provincial opinions of the nations a majority arranged by our agents what we need at that psychological moment is that the city capitals should not discuss our position of majority power for no other reason than that it has already been accepted by the public opinion of the majority in the rural provinces when we are in the period of the new regime but prior to the assumption of our full sovereignty we must not allow any revelation by the media to admit to any form of public dishonesty it is necessary that the new regime should be thought to have so perfectly contended everybody that even criminality has all but disappeared occurrences of criminality should remain only to the victims and to chance witnesses no one else protocol 13 distractions we need the goyim to keep silent and be our humble servants when we hired a goyim to work at our media companies we might order them to discuss things which are inconvenient for us to discuss directly via our official documents they will raise a din of discussion and create a distraction which will allow us to quietly introduce the laws that we want and then present them to the public as an accomplished fact no one will dare to demand the cancellation of a law that we've put forth especially since it will be presented as an improvement and immediately afterward the media will distract the current of thought towards new issues after all haven't we trained the people always to be seeking something new and exciting the brainless dispensers of opinions and forecasts will then throw themselves into the discussions of these new issues even now those people are not able to understand that they don't have the remotest conception about the matters to which they have chosen to discuss Political issues are simply incomprehensible to all except those who have guided it already for many ages, namely the creators of our philosophy. From all of this you will see that the apparent public opinion is that we are only carrying out the necessary functions of the government, and you may notice that it is not our actions but our words which seem to be more important when seeking approval. We are constantly making public declarations claiming that we are guided in all that we do by the hope and by the conviction that we are serving the common good in solving their problems. We deceive workers. Some people may be problematic for us in the way that they discuss political issues. In order to distract these people, we are now putting forward what we allege to be a new political issue, namely the question of industry. In this arena, let them discuss themselves silly. The masses have agreed to remain inactive, to take a rest from what they suppose are political actions, and we trained them to do this in order to use them as a means of combating the Goyim governments. They will remain this way only on condition of being found of new activities, and we are prescribing them something which looks like the same political goal. In order that the masses do not figure out what they are really doing, we will further distract them with amusements, games, pastimes, passions, luxury homes. Via the media, we shall soon begin to propose competitions in art and sport of all kinds. These interests will finally distract their minds from asking questions which we would definitely not want to have to answer. Growing more and more unaccustomed to reflect and form any opinions of their own, 
people will begin to talk in the same manner as we do, because we alone shall be offering them new directions for thought. Of course, we will do this through persons who will not be suspected of working alongside us. Alex Jones. The part played by the libertarians and utopian dreamers will be finally come to an end when our government is acknowledged. Up until that time, they will continue to do us good service. Therefore, we shall continue to direct their minds to all sorts of vain conceptions of fantastic theories that are new and apparently progressive. For we have completely and successfully attracted the brainless minds of the Goyim with the pursuit of progress to the point where there is not one Goyim mind able to perceive that under this world lies a departure from truth in all cases. With the exception of material inventions, progress is an illusory idea which serves to obscure truth. No one knows this truth except us, the chosen of God, and we are its guardians. When we finally come into our kingdom, our orators will talk about the great problems which had turned humanity upside down, and how these problems were brought an end under beneficent rule. Who will ever suspect then that all of these people were staged, managed by us, according to a political plan which no one has so much as, as guessed at in the course of so many centuries? Protocol 14. Assault on Religion When we come into our kingdom, we do not want any religion other than ours to exist. Our religion of the one God, with whom our destiny is bound up by our position as the chosen people, and through whom our same destiny is united with the destinies of this world. We must, therefore, sweep away all other forms of belief. If this gives birth to the atheists whom we see today, it will not interfere with our views, because it is only a transitional stage, but it will serve as a warning for future generations who will listen to our preaching of the religion of Moses, which, by its stable and thoroughly elaborated system, has brought all of the peoples of the world into our enslavement. In this, we shall emphasize its mystical right, on which we shall say all its educative power is based. Then, at every possible opportunity, we shall publish articles in which we shall make comparisons between our beneficent rule and those of ages past. The blessing of tranquility, even though it is a tranquility forcibly brought about by centuries of strife, will highlight the benefits of our system of government, and we shall point out these benefits. The errors of the Goyim governments will be depicted by us in the most explicit manner. We shall implant such an abhorrence of them that the peoples will prefer tranquility in a state of serfdom to those overemphasized rights of freedom which have tortured humanity and exhausted the very sources of human existence. Sources which have been exploited by a mob of rascally adventurers who don't know what they're doing. Worthless changes in government which we forced upon the Goyim when we were undermining their state structures will have so wearied the peoples by that time that they will prefer to suffer anything under us rather than run the risk of a gain enduring all of the misery and strife that they have already been put through. We shall forbid Christ. At the same time, we shall not forget to emphasize the historical mistakes of the Goyim governments which have tormented humanity for so many centuries by their lack of understanding of everything that constitutes the true good of humanity in their pursuit of ill-conceived schemes of social blessings. These governments have never noticed that these schemes kept on producing a worse and never better state of the universal relations which are the basis of human life. The whole strength of our principles and methods 
will lie in the fact that we shall present them in such great detail as a splendid alternative to the dead and decomposed old way of doing things in social life. Our philosophies discussed of all the shortcomings of the various beliefs of the Goyim, but no one will ever bring our faith from its true point of view under discussion since this will be fully learned only by ourselves and we will never ever dare to betray its secrets. In countries known as progressive and enlightened we have created senseless filthy abominable literature. For some time after our entrance to power, we shall continue to encourage its existence in order to provide some relief in contrast to the speeches and party politics which will be distributed from our grandiose quarters. Our wise and learned men, trained to become leaders of the Goyim, will compose speeches, presentations, memoirs, and articles. These will be used by us to influence the minds of the Goyim, directing them towards certain types of knowledge and conclusions which have been to be determined by us. Protocol 15. Ruthless Suppression We shall come into our kingdom by the aid of a sudden overthrow of a government done by our small group and carried out everywhere at once and all within a single day. It may be a while before this takes place, perhaps even a whole century. But when at last this definitely happens and has been definitely acknowledged, we shall make it our job to see that things such as plots against us shall no longer exist. With this purpose we shall slay without mercy all those who take up arms to oppose our coming into our kingdom. Every kind of new institution which is anything like a secret society will also be punished with death. Those of them which are now in existence are known to us. They serve us and have served us. We shall dissolve these and send their members into exile to continents far removed from Europe. In this way we shall deal with those Goyi Masons who know too much, some of whom we may spare for some reason and they will be kept in constant fear of exile. We shall formally declare a law making all former members of secret societies liable to exile from Europe, which will be the center of our rule. Resolutions of our government will be final and without appeal. The disagreement and Protestantism we had planted in the Goyim societies has now taken deep root. The only possible way of restoring order is to employ merciless measures that prove the effectiveness of the direct force of authority. No concern must be given to the victims who fall. They suffer for the well-being of the future. Achieving that state of well-being even at the expense of sacrifices, is the very duty of any kind of government that acknowledges as justification for its existence not only its privileges, but also of its obligations. The best way to guarantee stability of rule is to reinforce the aura of power, and this aura is gained only by displaying such a convincing stubbornness of might that it shall carry the banner of invincibility from mystical cause on its face, from the choice of God itself. It was like this until recent times when the Russian autocracy was the one and only serious foe that we had in the world, not counting the Pope of Rome. Bear in mind the example when Italy, drenched with blood, never touched a hair on the head of Sulla, who had poured forth that blood. Sulla enjoyed a godlike status for the might in him, but his fearless return to Italy made him appear sacred and invincible. The people do not lay a finger on someone who hypnotizes them by his daring and mental strength. Secret Societies Meanwhile, 
However, before we come into our kingdom, we shall act in the contrary way. We shall create and multiply free Masonic lodges in all the countries of the world and bring all types of people into them. People who may become or who all are already prominent in public activity. In these lodges we shall find our principal intelligence office and means of influence. We shall bring all of these lodges under one central administration, which known to us alone and absolutely unknown to all others, and which will be composed of our learned elders of Zion. The lodges will have their representatives who will serve to screen the above-mentioned administration of masonry and who will issue the watchword and program. In these lodges we shall tie the knot which binds together all revolutionary and liberal elements. They will come from all levels of society. The most secret political plots will be known to us and fall under our guiding hands on the very days of their conceptions. Among the members of these lodges will be almost all of the agents of international and national police, since their service for us is irreplaceable, based on the fact that the police are in a position to not only use their own political measures with members who are insubordinate, but also to screen our activities and provide pretexts for discontentments, etc. The classes of people who are most willingly to enter into secret societies are those who live by their wits, the career-seeking types, and in general mostly light-minded people, with whom we shall have no difficulty in dealing and in using to wind up the mechanism of the machine devised by us. If the world grows agitated, it is because we have had to stir it up in order to break it up, it because it has become too great in solidarity. But if a plot should arise in its midst, that the person in charge of that plot will be none other than one of our most trusted servants. It is natural that no one else other than we should lead Masonic activities, for we know where we are heading. We know the final goal of every type of activity performed. Whereas the Goyim have knowledge of nothing, not even of the immediate effect of an action. They usually only consider the momentary satisfaction which comes from the accomplishment of their thoughts. They do not notice that their thoughts did not arise from their own initiative, but from ideas which we planted in their minds. Gentiles are stupid. The Goyim enter the lodges out of curiosity or in the hope by using their resources, of getting a piece of the public pie, and some of them in order to attain a hearing before the public for their impractical and groundless fantasies. They thirst for the emotion of success and applause, and we always generously applaud them. And the reason why we give them the success is that it gives them an overrated opinion of themselves, which we can then make use of this conceit unconsciously causes them to include our suggestions into theirs without ever being on the guard against them. They are fully confident that it is their own infallibility which is giving rise to their own thoughts and that it is impossible for them to borrow those of others. You cannot imagine to what extent the wisest of the Goyim can be brought to a state of unconscious simple-mindedness in the presence of this condition of high conceit of themselves, and at the same time, how easy it is for them to take to heart is to take the heart out of them by the slightest ill success, even though it has nothing more than the lack of the applause which they previously had, and to reduce them to a slavish submission for the sake of winning a renewed success. Mm. We ourselves can disregard success so long as we are able to carry through our long-term plans. The Goyim, on the other hand, are willing to sacrifice long-term plans in order to have immediate success. Mm. Mm -mm. 
This psychology of theirs assists and enables us to set them in the required direction. These tigers in appearance have the soles of sheep, and the wind blows freely through their heads. We have set them on the hobby horse of an idea about the absorption of individuality in the symbolic unit of communism. They have never yet, and never will, have the sense to realize that this hobby horse is a clear violation of the most important law of nature, that it has created an entity quite different from any other since the very creation of the world itself, and that it is only with purpose in controlling individuality. Isn't the fact that we have been able to bring them to such an extent of stupid blindness a proof, and an amazingly clear proof, of the degree to which the mind of the Goyim is undeveloped in comparison with our own mind? Yes, it is, and this is what mainly guarantees our success. The Gentiles are but cattle. And how far-sighted were our learned elders in ancient times when they said that to attain a serious end, it is essential not to stop at any means or to count the victims sacrificed for the sake of that end, including those of our number. We have not counted the victims of the ancestry of the Goyim cattle, and we have sacrificed many of our own. But in exchange for that, we have now given them such a position on the earth as they could never have dreamed before now. The comparatively small numbers of the victims of our own people has preserved our nationality from utter destruction. Every being must die some day. So it is better that those who hinder our affairs die much sooner than we, since we are the founders of this great plan. We execute Masons in such a clever way that no one other than they, other than planning by us, their brotherhood, can ever suspect anything, not even the victims of our death sentence. They all die when required, as if from natural causes. Knowing this, even the Brotherhood dare not protest. Using these methods, we have removed the very root of protest against our management style out of the midst of the masonry. While preaching liberalism to the Goyim, at the same time we keep our own people and our agents in a state of unquestioning submission. Under our influence, the laws of the Goyim are rarely followed. The prestige of the law has been destroyed by the liberal interpretations introduced into this area. When it comes to the most important and fundamental affairs and questions, judges make the rulings that we tell them to make, and we surround them with information that tells them how to view matters so that they can be the administration of the Goyim. Of course, we carry out our work via persons who are our tools, and these people do not appear to have anything in common with us, example, by using newspaper opinions or by other means. Even senators and the higher administration accept our opinions and ideas. The undeveloped mind of the Goyim is simply incapable of doing analysis and observation, and even less capable of predicting where a certain manner of wording a law may lead. Based on this difference in capacity for thought between the Goyim and ourselves, it clearly marks us as being in our rightful position as the chosen people and of our higher quality of humanness in opposing contrast to the brute mind of the Goyim animals. Their eyes are open, but they see nothing before them and do not invent unless perhaps material things. From this it is so plain that nature herself has destined us to guide and rule this world. We demand submission. When the time comes for our overt rule, the time to manifest its blessing, we shall rewrite all legislation. All of our laws will be brief 
plain, stable, without any kind of interpretations so that anyone will be in a position to know them perfectly. The main feature which will run right through them is submission to orders, and this principle will be carried on to a grandiose height. Every abuse will then disappear as a result of the orders being enforced via a long chain of hierarchy of authority, leading from the lowest unit up to the very highest representative of our power. Subordinates of this highest representative who abuse their power will be so mercilessly punished that no one will be anxious to experiment with their own powers again. We shall eagerly follow up every action of the administration which the smooth running of the machinery of the state depends upon, for slackness in this produces slackness everywhere. Not a single case of illegality or abuse of power will go without a punishment designed to also serve as a strong warning and as an even stronger deterrent. Concealment of guilt, encouragement of wrongdoing between those in the service of this administration, all this kind of evil will disappear after the very first examples of severe punishment are meted out. The aura of our power demands suitable, that is, cruel punishments for the slightest infringement, and we do this to improve the prestige of our supreme power. The sufferer, through his punishment, may exceed his offense, will be counted as a soldier falling on the administrative field of battle in the interests of authority, principle, and most importantly, our supreme law. Our principles do not permit that any of those who hold the reins of the public coach should exit from the public highway to their own private roads. For example, our judges will know that whenever they feel disposed to pride themselves by handing out foolish pardons, they are violating the law of justice which was established for the moral education of men by giving punishment for wrongdoing and not for displaying the spiritual quality of the judges. Such qualities are proper to show in private life, but not in a public square which is the educational base of human life. Our legal staff will serve not beyond the age of fifty-five, Firstly, because old men more obstinately hold to prejudiced opinions and are less capable of submitting to new directions, and secondly, because this will give us the possibility of securing flexibility in the changing of staff who will then more easily bend under our pressure. He who wishes to keep his place will have to give us blind obedience to deserve it. In general, our judges will be elected by us and only from among those who thoroughly understand that the part they have to play is to punish and apply laws and not to dream about the manifestations of liberalism at the expense of the educational scheme of the state as the goyim these days imagine it to be. This method of shuffling the staff will also serve to break apart any collective solidarity of those in the same service and will bind them all to the interests of the government upon which their fate will depend. The young generation of judges will be trained to have certain views regarding the inadmissibility of any abuses which might disturb the established order of our subjects among themselves. Nowadays, the judges of the Goyim are tolerant toward every kind of crime. They do not have a proper understanding of their office because the rulers of today, when appointing judges, take no care to implant a sense of duty and consciousness in them toward the actions which are demanded. Just as a savage beast lets out its young in search of prey, so do the unthinking rulers let out their poorly trained judges to make a bad decision on cases of crime. Goyim then behave in a criminal manner that fits the purpose for which these judges' positions were created. This is the reason why their governments are being ruined by their own forces through the acts of their own administration. Let us use the results of these actions as an example for yet another lesson for our government. We shall root out liberalism from all the important strategic posts of our government which are in charge of the training of subordinates of our state structure. Such posts will be assigned exclusively to those who have been trained by us for administrative rule. 
To the possible objection that the retirement of old servants will cost the Treasury heavily, I reply firstly and absolutely that they will be provided with some private service in place of what they lose, and secondly, I need to point out that all the money in the world will be concentrated in our hands, so it is not our government that needs to fear the expense. We shall be cruel. Our totalitarianism will have all the components of its structure logically arranged, and therefore our superiority will be respected and unquestionably fulfilled in each one of its decrees. It will ignore all complaints, all disagreements of every kind, and will destroy the root of every kind of manifestation of them by punishments that are publicly visible. We shall abolish the right of judges to annul our rulings. This right will be transferred exclusively to us, to the jurisdiction of the ruler, for we must not ever allow the people to think that there could be such a thing as a decision which is considered wrong in the eyes of the judges who were appointed by us. But if anything like this should occur, we shall void the decision ourselves, and then inflict explicit punishment on the judge for failing to understand his duty and the purpose of his appointment. The punishment must be sufficient to prevent a repetition of such cases. I repeat that it must be deep-seated in our minds that we shall know every part of our admin administration. This administration only needs to be closely watched in order for the people to can be content with us, for the people have the right to demand that good officials come from a good government. Our government's ruler will have the appearance of a father figure guardian. Our own nation and our subjects will see in him a father caring for their every need, their every act, their every interrelation as subjects with one another as well as their relations to the ruler. They will then be so thoroughly filled with the thought that it is impossible for them to dispense with this guardianship and guidance, if they wish to live in peace and quiet, that they will then fully acknowledge the autocracy of our ruler with a devotion bordering on deity worship, especially when they are convinced that those whom we appoint do not put themselves in place of authority, but only blindly execute his dictates. They will be rejoiced that we have regulated everything in their lives, in much the same way as wise parents who wish to train their children to be duty-bound and submissive. For, in regard to the secrets of our system of government, the peoples of the world are always throughout history only underage children, just as their governments are likewise. As you see, I founded our despotism on right and duty. The right to compel the execution of duty is the direct obligation of a government which is a father for its subjects. It has the right of the strong, and the right to use that strength for the benefit of directing humanity towards that established order which is defined by nature, namely submission. Everything in the world is in a state of submission, if not to man, then to circumstances or its own character. In all th cases, everything is in submission to what is stronger, and so shall we be this something stronger for the sake of the greater good. We are obliged, without hesitation, to sacrifice individuals who commit a breach of established order because the explicit punishment of evil makes a great educational program. When our king of Israel sets the crown offered to him by Europe on it, upon his sacred head, he will become patriarch of the world. The necessary victims created by him as a result of their suitability, for example, criminals, will never reach the number of victims created in the course of centuries by the mania of magnificence, by the jealous rivalry among the Goyim governments. Our king will be in constant communion with the peoples, making famous speeches to them from the pulpit, which will be distributed over the entire world within the hour. Protocol 16. Brainwashing. In order to bring about the destruction of all collective forces except for ours, we shall disable the first stage of collectivism, the universities, by re-educating them in a new direction.
Their officials and professors will be prepared for their business by detailed secret programs of action from which they will not be allowed to diverge, not by one iota. They will be appointed with particular precaution and will be placed so as to be wholly dependent upon the government. We shall exclude state law from the course of instruction and also any material that deals with the political mechanism. These subjects will be taught to a few dozen persons chosen for their preeminent capacities from among those of the initiated. The universities must no longer graduate weak individuals concocting plans for a constitution, like a comedy or a tragedy. These people are concerning themselves with questions of policy in which not even their own fathers ever had any power of thought. When large numbers of persons attempt to deal with issues of administrative regulation, this creates utopian dreamers and bad subjects. You can see this for yourselves from the example of the universal education of the Goyim in this direction. We must introduce all of those principles into their education which have so brilliantly blo broken down their harmony. But when we are in power we shall remove every kind of disturbing subject from the course of education and shall turn the youth into obedient children of authority who love the ruler as being the support and hope for all peace and quiet. We shall rewrite history. Classicism, as with all other forms of study of ancient history, has more bad than good examples. We shall replace these with the study of the program of the future. We shall erase from the memory of men all facts of previous centuries which are undesirable to us and leave only those which show all the errors of the governments of the Goyim. The study of practical life, of the obligations of maintaining order, of the relations of people to one another, of avoiding bad and selfish examples which spread the infection of evil, and similar questions of an educative nature. We will bring these to the forefront of the teaching program. This program will be drawn up as a separate plan for each career path or position in life, and in this way it generalizes the teaching. This aspect of the program has special significant importance. Each career path or position in life must be trained within strict limits corresponding to its aim and how it fits in with day-to-day -day life. The occasional genius has always managed and always will manage to slip through into other positions of life, but it is a big mistake to let this rare occasional genius into ranks which are foreign to them. They are untalented people who take over the jobs belonging to those ranks granted by birth or employment. You know yourselves in what manner all this is ended for the Goyim who allow this crying absurdity. In order that the ruler may be firmly seated in the hearts and minds of his subjects, it is necessary for the duration of his reign to instruct the whole nation in the schools and on the marketplaces about the purpose of his actions and all of his beneficent initiatives. We shall abolish every kind of freedom of instruction. Learners of all ages have the right to assemble together with their parents in the educational establishments as if it were a club. During these assemblies and on holidays, Teachers will read what will pass as free lectures on social and relationship issues of the laws of examples and of the philosophy behind new theories not yet declared to the world. These theories will be raised by us to the stage of a dogma of faith, like as a traditional stage towards our faith. Now that I have completed this explanation of our program of action in the present and the future, I will read you the principles of these theories. Basically, we know from many centuries of experience that people live and are guided by ideas and that these ideas are absorbed by people only with the aid of education that has equal success for all ages of growth. But, of course, by various methods, we shall swallow up and confiscate the last scintilla of independence of thought. We have been directing all thoughts towards subjects and ideas that are useful to us and have been doing so for a very long time.
The system of bridling thought is already at work in the so-called system of teaching by object lessons, the purpose of which is to turn the goyim into unthinking submissive brutes, waiting for things to be presented before their eyes in order for them to form an idea of them. In France, one of our best agents, Bourgeois, has already made public a new program of teaching by object lessons. Protocol 17. Abuse of Authority. The practice of being a defense attorney produces men who are cold, cruel, persistent, and unprincipled, and who take up an impersonal, purely legal standpoint in all cases. They have the bad habit of basing their defense on the value of the people that they are representing and not on the public welfare of its results. They rarely decline to undertake any defense whatsoever. Instead, they strive for an acquittal at all costs, raising trivial objections over every nitpicking point of legislation, and in this way they demoralize justice. For this reason, we shall set this profession into narrow frames which will keep it inside a sphere of executive public service. Defense attorneys, equally with judges, will be deprived of the right of communication with the litigant. They will receive business only from the court and will study it by notes of report and documents, defending their clients after they have been interrogated in court on facts that they have appeared. They will receive a fixed payment without regard to the quality of their defense. This will render them a mere reporter on legal proceedings in the interests of justice and as a counterbalance to the prosecuting lawyer who will be the reporter in the interests for the prosecution. This will shorten business between the courts. In this way, a practice of honest, unprejudiced defense will be established which is not motivated by personal gain but rather by conviction. Incidentally, this will also remove the current practice of corrupt bargaining between different levels of courts which agrees to only let that side which pays the most win. We shall destroy the clergy. For a long time in the past, we have taken care to discredit the priesthood of the Goyim and thereby to ruin their mission on earth, which might still be a great hindrance to us in the present day. Day by day it is losing its influence on the peoples of the world. Freedom of thought has been declared everywhere, and the moment of the complete wrecking of the Christian religion is now only years away. As for other religions, we shall have even less difficulty in dealing with them, but it would be premature to speak of this now. We shall restrict the ability of the clergy to influence the government into such narrow frames as to make their influence move increasingly backward in comparison to their former progress. When the time finally comes to destroy the papal court, the finger of an invisible hand will point the nation's anger toward that court. Then, however, the nations have come to attack it we shall then come forward in the guise of its defenders as if to save excessive bloodshed. By this diversion we shall penetrate to its very inner sanctum and be sure to never come out again until we have gnawed through the entire strength of this place. The King of the Jews will be the first real Pope of the universe, the Patriarch of the International Church. But in the meantime while we are re-educating youth in new traditional religions, and then afterwards in our own, we shall not overtly lay a finger on existing churches, but we shall fight against them using criticism calculated to produce internal disunity. In general, then, our contemporary media will continue to condemn state affairs, religions, and imperfections of the Goyim, always using the most disrespectful expressions in order to lower their prestige by every means, and in a manner which can only be done by the genius of our gifted tribe. Our kingdom will be a representation of the Hindu deity Vishnu. Our hundred hands will be on the controls of the machinery of social life. 
we shall see everything without the aid of official police, which, because of the limitations on their powers, hinders governments from seeing properly. We have made a list of similar limitations to be applied on the Goyim. In our programs, one-third of our subjects will keep the rest under observation from a sense of duty, and on the principle of volunteer service to the state. It will then be no disgrace to be a spy and an informer, but a merit. False accusations made before a public prosecutor, however, will be cruelly punished so as to prevent abuses of this right. Our informers will be selected from all ranks of society, from among the administrative class who spend their time in amusements, editors, printers, and publishers, booksellers, clerks, and salesmen, workmen, coachmen, lackeys, etc. This body, having no rights and not being empowered to take any action on their own account, and consequently a police without any power, will only witness and report. Verification of their reports and arrests will depend upon a responsible group of controllers of police affairs, while the actual set of arrests will be performed by the gendarmerie and the municipal police. Any person not reporting anything seen or heard considering issues of political portents will also be charged with and made responsible for concealment, if it is proven that he is guilty of this crime. Just as nowadays our brethren are obliged at their own risk to formally condemn the Kabbalah apostates of their own family or members who have been noticed doing anything in opposition to the Kabbalah, so in our kingdom all over the world it will be obligatory for all of our subjects to observe the duty of service to the state in this direction. Such an organization will eliminate abuses of authority, a force of bribery, everything in fact which we, by our wisdom, by our theories of the superhuman rights of man, have introduced into the customs of the Goyim. But how else were we to bring about that increase of trigger events which lead to disorders within their administration? Among those methods, one of the most important is having agents for the restoration of order placed in such a way as to have the opportunity to cause problems. They will use their disintegrating activity to develop and display their evil inclinations, obstinate self-conceit, irresponsible exercise of authority, and firstly and foremostly, an openness to bribery and corruption. Protocol 18. Arrest of Opponents. When we need to give more power to our secret police, which are the very best form of defense for those in authority, we will arrange for some fake disorders to take place. We will then arrange for a group of skilled speakers who will cooperate in pretending to be angry citizens crying out about this outrage. People who are sympathetic to what is being said will then gather around these speakers. They will give us the pretext for demanding that a select group of Goyim police be able to put people's homes under surveillance. Most conspirators act because they enjoy that type of activity and like to brag about it afterward. So, until they do something big, we will not do anything to them except to bring a few things to their attention. If a government frequently discovers that there are conspiracies against them, this gives them a very bad image. It makes them look like they know that they are weak, or worse yet, that they know that they are unjust. As you are well aware, we have damaged the image of the Goyim kings by making frequent assassination attempts upon them. We have done this through our agents, some of whom are people who blindly believe and act upon what we tell them providing, however, that we phrase it in a freedom-seeking political manner. We have forced the rulers to acknowledge their weakness by showing everyone the many secret plots against them. In this way, we shall destroy their authority. Our ruler will be secretly protected only by a minimal number of guards, because we do not want anyone to think that there could be any true rebellion against him which he was not strong enough to handle, and, therefore, needed to hide from. 
If we allowed people to think this, as the Goyim have done and are doing, we would be effectively signing an early death sentence, if not for our ruler, then for his dynasty. Government by Fear our ruler must appear to only use his power for the benefit of the nation and to never build his own dynasty. In this way, his authority will be respected and guarded by the subjects themselves. It will be elevated to a glorified status because it will be seen as tied up with the well-being of every citizen of the state and because the common people depend upon that order which this authority brings. When a ruler is seen to surround himself with a large number of guards, this gives the appearance that he is weak and unable to organize his own defense. Our glorious ruler will always be among the people, and will be surrounded by a mob of apparently curious men and women. They will occupy the front ranks about him, and this will be all appearance to one by chance. These people will restrain the ranks of the other people, and it will appear that they are doing this out of respect and to maintain good order. This will set an example of restraint and encourage the same behavior in others around them. If a petitioner appears from among the people and forces his way through the ranks in order to hand a petition to the ruler, the first ranks must receive this petition and, before the eyes of the petitioner, pass it to the ruler. In this way, everyone will know what that it has been handed in reaches its destination, and that consequently there is some control over the ruler himself. The aura of power requires that the people be able to say, quote, If the king knew of this, or if the king will hear of this, end quote. Once an official defense for authority has been established, its prestige disappears. Then, given certain degree of daring, everyone could promote himself as an authority. The promoter of rebellion becomes conscious of his strength. He then awaits for an appropriate time to make his attempt upon authority. We keep telling the Goyim that it is better to have a visible defense, even though we know it is best to do the opposite. But this enables us to see what this type of defense does to them. Criminals without our ranks will be arrested at the first, more or less, well-grounded suspicion. Even though, out of fear for our defense, we may make a mistake in wrongly accusing someone, we cannot allow that person whom we suspect of a political crime to escape. So, in these matters, we shall be literally merciless. It may still be possible, if we stretch the legal points, to reconsider a verdict on simple crimes by examining the motives behind them, but there is no possibility of excuse for persons attempting to involve themselves in issues which can only be understood by the government itself, and not all governments understand true policy. Protocol 19 Rulers and the People Although we will not permit any independent person to meddle in our political affairs, we shall, on the other hand, encourage every kind of report or petition with proposals for the government to look into all kinds of projects for the improvement of the condition of the people. This will reveal the defects and fantasies of our subjects to us. We shall respond to these proposals by either carrying them out or by providing a wise rebuttal to prove their short-sightedness. Incitement of a rebellion is nothing more than the yapping of a lapdog at an elephant. For a government that is well organized, not from the police, but from the public's point of view, the lapdog yaps at the elephant without being aware of its strength and of its importance. All it takes is a good example to show the relative importance of both, and the lapdogs will cease to yap, and will instead wag their tails from the moment that they see the elephant. In order to destroy the prestige of heroism for political crime, we shall put it on trial in the category of thieving, murder, and every other kind of abominable and filthy crime. Public opinion will then be confused with political crime, 
and the disgrace attached to those other types of crimes, and will then brand it with the same contempt. We have done our level best, and I do hope that we have succeeded in ensuring that the Goyim should never consider that rebellion as a good thing. It was for this reason that through the media, in speeches and indirectly, in cleverly written school books on history, we had advertised the martyrdom, allegedly recommended by rebellion mongers, as a way of securing the common welfare of the public. This advertisement has increased the percentage of freedom seekers and has brought thousands of goyim into the ranks of our livestock cattle. Protocol 20 Financial Program Today we'll talk on the financial program. I've put this off to the end of my report as being the most difficult but also the most important and decisive point of our plans. Before starting on it, I must remind you that I have already spoken about it earlier by way of a hint when I said that the sum total of our actions is settled by financial issues, particularly the question of large amounts of money. When we come into our kingdom, our autocratic government will avoid overtaxing the people. It will do this for reasons of self-preservation, because it sensibly remembers that it plays the part of father and of protector. But running a state organization is very expensive, so it is still necessary to obtain the funds required for it. It will therefore enter into elaborate and open discussions on how to find the right balance on questions of taxation. Our rule of power, in which the king will enjoy the legal fiction that everything in his state belongs to him, and this may easily be translated into fact, will be enabled to resort to the lawful confiscations of all amounts of wealth of every kind for the use of and circulation within the state. From this we conclude that the best kind of taxation will be a progressive tax on property. In this manner the tax will be paid without overly stressing or ruining anyone, because it will be a percentage of the value of their property. The rich must be aware that it is their duty to place part of their superfluous wealth at the disposal of the state, since the state guarantees them security of possession of the remainder of their property and the right toward honest gains. I say honest because our determination over who owns what will do away with the need for robbery in the standard legal sense. This social reform must come from the government because the time is ripe for it. It is necessary as a pledge of peace from the government to the people. We shall destroy capital. Taxing poor people works to the detriment of the state, firstly because it pushes them toward revolt, and secondly it wastes energy in pursuing tiny amounts instead of large ones. You see, quite apart from this, a tax on capitalists can be used to diminish the growth of wealth in private hands. Lately we have been concentrating wealth into private hands as a way of taking it away from the Goyim government. This reduces their strength because that strength comes from their state finances. A tax which increases as a percentage ratio on capital will give a much larger revenue than the present individual or property tax. The present tax structure is useful to us now for the sole reason that it stirs up trouble and discontent among the different classes of the Goyim. The amount of power that our king has will depend on the equilibrium and the guarantee of peace. For the sake of these things, it is absolutely necessary that the capitalists should give up a portion of their incomes so that the machinery of the state works securely. The state's requirements must be paid by those who will not feel the burden and who have enough money that they can afford to have it taken from them. Such a measure will end the hatred of the poor man for the rich. The poor will now see the rich as a necessary financial support for the state and the organizer of peace and well-being, since the poor man will see that it is the rich man who is providing the necessary means to attain these ends. In order that taxpayers from the educated classes do not get too distressed, 
over the new payments, they will be provided with full details of where the money will go. With the exception of the money that is required for the needs of our king and the institutions which support the administration of those needs. Mm. Our king will not have any properties of his own, because the sum of all properties in the state represents his inherited kingdom estate. If the king were said to have ownership of a specific property, this would contradict his ownership of all other properties, and thus destroy his right to the ownership of those properties. Relatives of our ruler with the exception of his heirs, who will be maintained by the resources of the state, must work for their livelihood, and to obtain the rights to property. The privilege of royal blood must not be used to drain the treasury. Receipt of money from purchases or from inheritance will be subject to the payment of a progressive stamp tax. Any transfer of money or other property which will be strictly registered by names, that is done without evidence of payment of this tax, will render the former owner liable to pay interest on the tax, from the moment of transfer of these sums up to the date of discovery of his evasion of declaration of the transfer. Transfer documents must be presented within one week at the local treasury office with notifications of the given name, surname, and permanent place of re residence of the former, and the new owner of the property. This transfer document must include a definite sale, price amount, which exceeds the ordinary and necessary expenses of buying and selling, and this will be subject to payment of a stamp duty based upon a fixed percentage of the property value. Think about how taxes like these will cover the revenue of the Goyim state so many times over. We cause depressions. The state treasury will be required to keep a certain amount of money in reserve, and anything that is collected in excess of that amount must be returned to circulation. This will be done by spending that excess on public works projects. This type of spending will bind the working class firmly to the interests of the state and to those who, resign, who reign. Some money will also be set aside as rewards for incentiveness and productivity. On no account should any more than the required reserve be kept in state treasuries. Money exists to be circulated, and any kind of stagnation of money works against the best interest of the state machinery. Money is the lubricant of this machinery, and a stagnation of this lubricant may stop the regular working of the entire mechanism. Using currency to purchase interest-bearing paper, bonds, instead of spending it, has produced this kind of stagnation exactly. The consequences of this circumstance are already quite noticeable. A chart of accounts will also be established by us, and in it the ruler will find the full accounting of state income and expenditure at any moment in time. That is, with the exception of the current monthly account, which will not have been done yet, and that of the preceding month, which may not yet have been delivered. The one and only person who will have no interest in robbing the state is its owner, our ruler. That is why his personal control will remove the possibility of extravagant spending by others. The ceremonial duties of our ruler, such as being present at formal receptions for the sake of etiquette, absorb so much of his valuable time, and will be abolished so that the ruler may have time for control and for consideration. His power will not, be, will not then be split up into fractional parts among the time-consuming political celebrities who surround the throne for its pomp and splendor and who are only interested in themselves and not in the common interests of the state. Economic crises have been produced by us for the Goyim by no other means than the withdrawal of money from circulation. Huge sums of capital have stagnated by withdrawing money from states, which were constantly obliged to apply to those same stagnant capitals towards the payment of loans. These loans burdened the finances of the state with the payment of interest and made them the bonded slaves of these capitals. 
the concentration of money invested in industry in the hands of capitalists who have taken that money out of the hands of small investors has drained away all the juices of the peoples and also the states alongside them the current supply and issuance of money in general does not correspond with the requirements per head and therefore cannot satisfy all of the needs for the workers the available supply of money ought to correspond with the growth of population and therefore children also must absolutely be counted as consumers of currency from the day of their birth the subject of money supply is a material question for the whole of the world you are aware that the gold standard has been the ruin of the states which adopted it because it has not been able to satisfy the demands for money especially as we have removed gold from circulation as far as possible gentile states bankrupt for us the currency standard which must be introduced is the cost of working man power whether it is represented in paper or represented in wood. We shall issue money in accordance with the normal requirements of each subject, adding to the quantity with every birth and subtracting with every death. The accounts will be managed by each department, such as the French Administrative Division, and each circle of staff within the departments. In order that there may be no delays in the paying out of money for state needs, the amount and terms of such payments will be fixed by decree of the ruler. This will do away with the protection by a ministry of one institution to the detriment of others. The budgets of income and expenditure will be developed side by side so that they may not be obscured by the distances between each other. The reforms proposed by us in the financial institutions and principles of the Goyim will be disguised in such a way that they won't alarm anyone. We shall point out that these reforms are absolutely necessary as a result of the disorderly darkness which the Goyim have plunged the finances into as a result of their accounting irregularities. The first irregularity as we shall point out, consists of their drawing up of a single annual budget which grows year after year owing to the following cause. This budget is consumed within half the year. They then demand a budget to put things right, and then they use this up in three months, after which they ask for a supplementary budget. All of this ends with a liquidation budget. But, as the budget of the following year is drawn up in accordance with the sum total of the previous year's budgets, the annual departure from the normal reaches as much as 50% in a year, and so the annual budget is trebled in 10 years. Thanks to such methods allowed by the carelessness of the Goyim states, their treasuries are now empty. The period of borrowing which follows has swallowed up what remains and brought all of the Goyim states to full bankruptcy. You understand perfectly well that economic arrangements of this kind, which we have suggested to the Goyim, cannot be carried on by us. Every kind of loan demonstrates a weakness in the state and a lack of understanding of the rights of that state. Loans hang as a sword of Damocles over the heads of rulers who, instead of taking the desired amount from their subjects by way of a temporary tax, come begging with outstretched palms to our bankers. Foreign loans are leeches, and there is no possibility of removing them from the body of the state until they fall off of themselves, or the state flings them off. But the Goyim states do not tear them off. They go on in persisting in putting more and more on themselves, so that they must inevitably perish, drained by voluntary bloodletting. THE TYRANNY OF USURY What substance makes up a loan, especially a foreign loan? A loan is defined as an issue of government bills of exchange containing a percentage obligation based on the sum of the loan capital. For example, if the loan bears a charge of 5%, then in 20 years the state vainly pays away a sum equal to the loan borrowed just as interest. In 40 years, it is paying double that amount. 
in sixty treble, and all the while the capital, principal, portion of the debt remains unpaid. Hmm. From this calculation, it is obvious that, with any form of taxation per head, the state is bailing out the last pennies of the poor taxpayers in order to settle accounts with wealthy foreigners. The state has borrowed money from these foreigners instead of collecting those pennies for its own needs from the taxpayers without the additional interest. So long as loans were internal, the goyim only shuffled their money from the pockets of the poor to those of the rich. But when we changed the system in order to transfer loans into the external sphere, all the wealth of the states flowed into our cash boxes, and the goyim became our subjects. If countries have accumulated enormous debts that are impossible to repay, it is not just because the goyim kings have been careless in the way that they handle corruption of their ministers, or that they lack an understanding in financial matters, but it is also due to our actions, which have required much trouble and great expense on our part. Stagnation of money will not be allowed by us, and therefore will be no state interest-bearing bonds, except a 1% series. So there will be no payment of interest to leeches that suck all the strength out of the state. The right to issue interest-bearing bonds will be given exclusively to industrial companies who have no difficulty in paying interest out of their profits. Whereas the state does not make profits on borrowed money like these companies do, for the, states, for the state borrows to spend and not to use in its operations. Industrial bonds will also be bought by the government. This will transform these industries into lenders of money at profit. This measure will stop the stagnation of money, parasitic profits and idleness. These things were useful for us when we were among the independent Guayim, but they are not desirable under our own rule. It should now be quite obvious that the brain power of the Goyim is undeveloped based upon the fact that they have been borrowing from us and paying interest without ever thinking that the same amount of money plus that interest must be taken from their own state pockets in order to settle up the accounts with us. What could have been simpler than to take the money they wanted from their own people? But it is a proof of the genius of our chosen mind that we have cleverly planned to present the matter of loans to them in such a manner that they have ever even seen as an advantage for themselves. Our accounts, which we shall present when the time comes, and which are based on the experience gained by centuries of experiments made by us on the Goyim states, will be distinguished by clearness and definiteness, and will be shown to everyone at a glance the advantage of our innovations. They will put an end to those abuses to which we owe our mastery over the Goyim, but which cannot be allowed in our own kingdom. We shall set up our system of accounting in such a way that neither the ruler nor the most insignificant public servant will be in a position to divert even the smallest sum from its destination without detection, nor to direct it in another manner that is contrary to our fixed and definite plan of action. And, without a definite plan, it is impossible to rule. Marching along an undetermined road, and with undetermined resources, brings a nation to ruin by the way of heroes and demigods. The Goyim rulers, whom we once upon a time advised, should avoid their ceremonial duties of being a representative at state receptions, observances of etiquette and entertainments, were only smoke screens covering for our rule. The favorite courtiers, who replaced the rulers in the sphere of ceremonial affairs, were placed there by our agents, and every time gave satisfaction to short-sighted minds by, by promises that future economics and improvements were foreseen. Economics from what? From new taxes? These are questions that might have been, but were not, asked by those who read our accounts and our projects. You know what shape they are in you 
to this carelessness, and to what degree of financial disorder they have arrived, putting aside the astonishingly successful industries of their people. Protocol 21. Loans and Credit to what I reported to you at the last meeting, I shall now add a detailed explanation of internal loans. I will not say any more about foreign loans, because they have fed us with the national monies of the Goyim. But for our state there will be no foreigners, that is, nothing external. We have taken advantage of the mistakes of administrators and slackness of rulers to get our money twice, thrice, and more times over by lending monies to the Goyim governments, which were not at all needed by the states. Could anyone get away with making the same types of loans to us? Obviously not. So I shall only deal with the details of internal loans. The process begins by the state announcing that it needs to borrow money from the public. Interest-bearing paper, known as bills of exchange, will be printed and offered for sale. In order that these are within reach of everyone's investment capacity, the prices of these bills will be kept low, and a discount will be offered for early subscribers. The next day, by artificial means, the prices of those will go up. The alleged reason being that everyone is rushing to buy them. In a few days, the Treasury safes are, so to speak, overflowing, and there's more money than they can deal with. The subscription, it is alleged, covers the issue of the loan total many times over, and this lies the whole stage effect. Hey, look, they say, what confidence is being shown in the government's bills of exchange? But once the, com the comedy has played out, there emerges the fact that a debit, and an exceedingly burdensome debit, has been created. In order to pay the interest on this debit, it is becoming necessary to take out new loans, which do not reduce, but only add to the debt being owed. And, when this credit is exhausted, it becomes necessary to introduce new taxes to cover, not the principal of the loan, mind you, but only the interest upon it. These taxes are a debit created to cover a debit. Mm. Eventually, the time comes for converting the interest-bearing paper into cash. But due to the large debit problems described above, the government announces that it will need to reduce the payment of interest without covering the principal portions of that debt. And another problem that they will claim is that they cannot do this conversion without the consent of the lenders, many of whom are not willing to convert their paper. If everyone expressed his unwillingness and demanded his money back, the government would be hooked on their own promises and would be found insolvent and unable to pay the proposed sums. But, unfortunately for the Goyim governments, their subjects have know nothing about financial affairs and have always preferred losses on exchange and reduction of interest to the risk of new investment of their monies. This trick has enabled these governments to throw a debit of several million off their backs on many occasions. Nowadays, with external loans, these tricks cannot be played on us by the Goyim because they know that we shall demand all of our monies back. In this way, acknowledged bankruptcy will prove to the people of various countries that their rulers do not have the financial resources to look after them. I beg you, to focus your attention upon this point and upon the following. Nowadays, all interest loans are consolidated by so-called short-term or flying loans, that is, that they have terms of payment more or less coming near. These debts consist of monies paid into the savings banks and reserve funds. If left for long in the hands of government, these funds will evaporate by way of payments of interest on foreign loans, but the funds are placed on deposit at these banks for equivalent amounts of rents. The rent, also known as interest, 
paid by the banks on these deposits should cancel the interest payable on foreign loans and patch up all the leaks in the state treasuries of the Goyim. When we ascend to the throne of the world, all of these financial and similar types of transfers will be swept away so as not to leave a trace because they are not in accord with our interests. All money markets will also be destroyed, since we shall not allow the prestige of our power to be shaken by fluctuations of prices set upon in their values. We shall announce by law the price of securities which represents their full worth without any possibility of lowering or raising it. Raising gives the pretext for lowering, which indeed was where we made a start in lowering the values of the Goyim. We shall replace the money markets by grandiose government credit institutions, the purpose of which will be to fix the price of industrial values, stock prices, in accordance with government views. These institutions will be in a position to fling upon the market hundreds or millions of industrial bonds in one day, or to buy up the same amount. In this way, all industrial undertakings will come to depend on us. You can imagine what immense power we shall secure for ourselves in this way. Protocol 22. The Power of Gold In everything that I reported to you so far, I have endeavored to carefully describe the secret of what is coming, of what happened in the past, of what is happening now, and what will be happening while rushing into the flood of great events coming in the near future. I have also described the secret of our relations to the Goyim and of our financial operations. On this subject there still remains a little for me to add. In our hands is the strongest power of our day, gold. In two days we can procure from our storehouses any quantity we may please. Surely there is no need to seek further proof that our rule is predestined by God. Surely we shall not fail with such wealth to prove that all the evil which we have had to commit over so many centuries has served at the end of ends the cause of true well-being, the bringing of everything into order, yes? Even though we need to use some violence, we still establish our rule. We shall ingenu ingeniously prove that we are benefactors who have restored the true good and freedom of the person to the torn and mangled earth. And in this way we shall enable it to be enjoyed in peace and quiet, with proper dignity of relations with their government. This is all on the condition, of course, that strict observance be given to the laws established by us. We shall make it clearly known that freedom does not consist of careless self-indulgence, nor of the right to do anything that is desired, any more than the dignity and character of a gentleman does not consist in the right to promote destructive principles in the nature of freedom of thought. In the same way it follows, that freedom of the person in no way consists in the right to agitate oneself and others by abominable speeches before disorderly mobs. That true freedom consists in the righteousness of the person who honorably and strictly observes all the laws of life in common. That human dignity is wrapped up in the awareness of the rights and also of the absence of rights of each person. And not wholly and solely and fantastic imaginings about the subject of one's ego. A single authority will be glorious because it will be all-powerful. It will rule and guide and not muddle along after leaders and orators shrieking themselves hoarse with senseless words which they call great principles, and, honestly speaking, they are nothing but unrealistic schemes of idealized perfection. Our authority will be the crowning achievement of order and included in that is the whole happiness of mankind. The aura of this authority will inspire a mystical bowing of the knee before it, and a respectful fear of all the peoples before it. True force does not negotiate with any right, not even with that of God. None dare come near to it, not even to take so much of an inch of it away. Protocol 23 
instilling obedience. In order that the peoples may become accustomed to obedience, it is necessary to frequently impose lessons of humility, and therefore we need to reduce the production of luxury items. By doing this, we shall improve morals which have been depreciated by the emulation of luxurious lifestyles. We shall resurrect small business production which will require placing a landmine under the private capital of large manufacturers. This is also necessary for the reason that large manufacturers often move, although not always deliberately, the thoughts of the masses in directions against the government. A society of small business masters knows nothing of unemployment, and this binds them closely with existing order, and consequently with the firmness of authority. For us, its role will have been played out, and hence no longer be useful once authority is transferred into our hands. Drunkenness will also be prohibited by law, and punishable as a crime against the humanness of man, who is turned into a brute under the influence of alcohol. Subjects, I repeat once more, give blind obedience only to authority figures that are strong and absolutely independent of them, because they feel that these figures are a defense against social evils. Why would they want a king with an angelic spirit? What they need to see in him is the personification of force and power. The existing rulers are currently dragging out their existence among societies, demoralized by us. Those societies have denied even the authority of God, who now feeds the fire of anarchy on all sides. The Supreme Lord, who will replace all these rulers, must first proceed to quench this all-devouring flame. Therefore, he will be obliged to kill off those existing societies, even though he should need to drench them with the blood of his own people, so that he may resurrect them again in the form of a regularly organized troop, fighting conscientiously against every kind of infection that may cover the body of the state with sores. This chosen one of God is chosen from above to demolish the senseless gleam forces, which are moved by instinct and not by reason, by brutish force and by humanness. These goyim forces now triumph in manifestations of robbery and every kind of violence under the guise of principles of freedom and rights. They have overthrown all forms of social order to erect themselves on the ruins of the throne of the king of the Jews. But their part will have been played out from the moment our king enters into his kingdom. Then it will be necessary to sweep them away from his path and there must be no trace of them left upon it. Then it will be possible for us to say to the peoples of the world, quote, Give thanks to God and bow on your knee before our king who bears on his front the seal of the predestination of man. God himself has led his star such that none other but him may free us from above all mentioned forces and evils. End quote. Protocol 24. The final protocol. The qualities of our ruler. I'll now discuss the method of fully confirming the dynastic roots of King David. This method of confirmation will also serve as a basis for directing the education and thought of all of humanity and is based on the conservative conduct of our learned elders and managing the affairs of the world. Certain members of the descendants of David will select and prepare the kings and their heirs. They will be selected not by right of heritage, but by their eminent capabilities. They will be inducted into the most secret mysteries of political methods and schemes of government, although they will not be given specific knowledge of those secrets. The purpose of this mode of action is demonstrate to everyone that government cannot be entrusted to those who have not been inducted into the secret places of its art. To those who are selected, they will only be taught the practical application of the plans, which I described earlier, by comparing the experiences of many centuries and by making careful observations on all the political economic moves and social sciences 
In other words, they will study the substance of all the laws which have been unshakably established by nature herself for the regulation of the relations of humanity. Direct heirs will often be prevented from ascending to the throne if, during their time of training, they exhibit frivolity, softness, or other qualities that are the reign of a ruin of authority. Such qualities render them incapable of governing and are dangerous for kingly office. Only those who are unconditionally capable of firm direct rule will receive the reins of rule from our learned elders, even if they are this way to the point of cruelty. In case of falling sick with weakness of will or other form of incapacity, kings must by law hand over the reins of rule to new and capable hands. The king's plan of action for the current moment and all the more so for the future, will be unknown even to those who are called his closest counselors. The King of the Jews Only the king and, the only, and only the three who sponsored him will know what is coming. The king will be seen as a person of unbending will who is master of himself and of all humanity. All will see his position and rise to power as though it were fate with its mysterious ways. None will know what the king wishes to attain by his plans, and therefore none would dare to stand across an unknown path. The mental abilities of the king must be sufficient to deal with the plans of the government. For this reason, he will not be permitted to ascend to the throne until after an examination of his mind by our learned elders. In order that the people may know and love their king, it is necessary for him to converse in the marketplaces with the people. This brings the government and the people together as a combined force, two groups which were previously divided by the terror which was brought by us against the people. It was necessary for us to use this terror to bring forces of the people and their government under our influence. The king of the Jews must not be at the mercy of his passions, and especially of his senses. On no side of his character must he allow brute instincts to overpower his mind. Sensuality, worse than anything else, disorganizes the capacities of the mind and clearness of views. It distracts thoughts to the worst and most brutal side of human activity. The supreme lord of the entire world, in the form of the holy seed of David, represents the prop of humanity 